everybody. Good evening, everybody. Um, hey, Bobby, could you put those on? Thank you, sir. Welcome to the June 22nd uh, City Council meeting. Before we start, um, I'm going to have to insist that by, by, by declaration, you have to wear a mask in a public meeting. And I know it's unfortunate, not everybody wants to comply, but we've already had a complaint. And as a result of that, I'm gonna ask all of the public to wear their masks. I understand that you may not want to, but like once somebody says, there's always an option to leave, and you, you can exercise that option. This is not up for discussion. This is mandated. And we as a city, whether we agree or not agree, is not the issue. We have to do our best to comply with the, with the, with the, with the directive as per the California governor's directive. Thank you for your patience and understanding with this. I'm not gonna entertain any, dis any questions or enter, any, enter, enter in any discussion on this. Please do your best to comply. That being said, we'll go ahead and officially call this meeting to order and ask Captain Williams to lead the pledge. Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, if you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Before we start roll, I would just like to confirm that our attorney, David Snow, is online. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I am here. Thank you. Okay. Um, Council Member Riddell, are you online? Yes, I am. Thank you. Jennifer, will you call roll, please? Council Member Riddell? Here. Council Member Bogue? Here. Council Member Duncan. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Allen. Present. Mayor Avila. Here. Okay, Ray Casey, are there any changes to the agenda? Uh, no changes to the agenda this evening, Mr. Mayor. I do, would like to say for the record though, uh, the Finance Committee met earlier today and reviewed and approved uh, staff recommendations on uh, items number 16, 19, 20, and 22. And 16 is on the consent calendar, just for the record. Thank you. Okay, now it's time for public comment. We have approximately 20 speakers, I believe. Ms. Crawford, is that correct, about 20? So we're gonna to have to, in the interest of time, we wanna make sure everybody gets heard. Uh, we're gonna to have to reduce the time limit to two minutes. We have a heavy, heavy agenda, and we need to push along. I'd like to remind everybody that if you do have a public comment, you're more than welcome. The public comment sheets are on that table, and you can, you can speak on any subject that you want, in particular on the agenda or anything else in general. Again, we're gonna limit to two minutes. I'm gonna do my best um, to, to hold you to that. Uh, if it's compelling, I can give you a little extra time, but again, um, we need to move forward as, as fast as we can, or not, at, expeditiously as we can. So, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do, um, I'm going to call the first person up, and then I'm going to ask for the second and third person to cue themselves, so this will help us move along. Okay, first out of the box is Micah Rainey, and then uh, David Duran, and Callista Strasser. Mr. Rainey, re repeat your name, make sure it's pronounced properly, and give us your address. My name is Micah Rainey. Um, sorry, repeat the address? Yes, please. 11864 Lombard Lane. Thank you. All right, Mayor Avila, Yucaipa City Council, and Yucaipa Community, my name is Micah Rainey. I'm one of the voices behind the letter written and presented to the City Council two weeks ago that garnered several hundred signatures. The concern we addressed is the need for a community where all members feel welcome and safe, regardless of their background. The events of June 1st, and what followed are deeply concerning, and this is why we wrote asking you to condemn racism in our community. 
We have yet to receive any comment, public statement, or official condemnation of the events and subsequent attitudes expressed after June 1st. What are we to conclude from the silence? Conclusion number one, does this mean that you and the city council do not think that there's an issue that needs to be addressed in this community? If that's the case, we ask you to listen to the voices of the community members who do not feel welcome or safe in our community. Our letter, as well as what I've personally witnessed in Yukaipa, provide more than enough personal stories to show that this is a pertinent issue. Conclusion number two, should we conclude from the silence that you and the city council are okay with what happened on June 1st and the surrounding incidents? Well, I protested and walked down our boulevard. Members of this community told me to F off, have also flipped me off, told me to go home, and also have told me to go back to my liberal education camp at UC Irvine. Do you think that's okay? And don't just take my own personal experience because that compels in comparison to the other things that have happened here in Yukaipa. Once again, I appeal to you to listen and consider what your silence is communicating. Perhaps you are aware that there's a problem with racism in our community and you are afraid of the possible backlash. I understand we're surrounded by tension. However, we need to take a stance now. I would ask that you consider the potential for good outcomes from the difficult conversations that need to take place. Right now, we have an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is David Duran. Thank you for the privilege of, privilege of speaking before the uh, city council and, and management. Uh, keep to your two minutes. Uh, uh, shoot, there's not much to talk about, but uh, there's also much to be appalled about in our city of Yukaipa. The city council is about to grant Birtech an increase in rates during a time of the COVID-19 crisis, which has produced stress on businesses and residents alike. I urge you to tell the company to tighten their belt and come back next year just as much as we have. The second thing I'm appalled about is the conduct of the men who armed themselves with live, with, excuse me, with live ammunition, ostensibly to protect uptown Yukaipa. I am appalled that a sitting councilman armed himself and joined that group. I'm appalled that another city councilman, sitting councilman, applauded him. I'm appalled to learn that the Yukaipa Performing Arts Center is costing taxpayers and will continue to cost taxpayers $500,000 to $600,000 a year to operate. I must have been behind the door when the council acknowledged the expenditure at the onset of the idea of creating the Yukaipa Performing Arts Center. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Duran. Next is Callista Strasser, and on deck is Mark Westwood and Marion Lovelace. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I am a business owner here in Yukaipa. Though I'm not born and raised in this town, I am a transplant out of Orange County. I came here four years ago. I invested close to a half a million dollars in my business because I enjoyed this community. I thought it was a beautiful place full of beautiful people. I've had nothing but pleasant and good experiences with everybody in this town. Um, I may not look like a person of color, but I am, I'm first generation Colombian. I have not experienced any racism in this town. And I truly believe that those actions that happened on June 1st were not racist actions or race driven, they were fear driven. I came home from Arizona after two weeks being gone with no cell phone reception, not knowing what was going on. I came to my business and I saw the whole uptown area boarding up and people were in sh fear and shock and dismay, worrying about if they were gonna lose everything they had and they worked their entire lives for like I did because insurance only covers so much. So I did like everybody else did and boarded up and was completely terrified of what was may or may not happen. I mean, if you look at San Bernardino and you look at Seattle, you can see that that is a possibility that could have happened here. And had those people not been outside using whatever presence they used, which may or may not reflect on every single business owner here in Yukaipa, because I did not conduct myself in that fashion. However, had they not done that, maybe something terrible would have happened here. And 
I don't think that there was any hate involved. I think it was more like everybody wanted to get together and protect this town and everything they've worked hard for. And I believe the city should stand behind their councilmen. My predecessors, Bob and Sharon Orr, have had nothing but good things to say about Mr. Duncan here. And I don't believe that the town should turn their backs on the citizens that are the bread and butter of this town and the backbone of this town that have their small businesses here. And we should all be called racists or you know, all these things that they're calling us and slandering our good name. It's not gonna make people like me come from Orange County and invest in this town by allowing people to sit around and slander all of us for the actions of a few bad apples, kind of like what happened in Minnesota. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, Mark Westwood. Thank you, uh, members of the city council and residents of Ukaipa for letting me speak. I'm here presenting on behalf of the Ukaipa Calamasa Democratic Club. Um, this club is 25 years old this year and is one of the oldest continuously serving Democratic clubs in San Bernardino County. It's right here in Ukaipa. And this is an official resolution from the Ukaipa Calamasa Democratic Club in support of Black Lives Matter and against systematic police and institutional violence against blacks and people of color. It has three whereases and one therefore. If you'll oblige me, I'll read it to you. Whereas Black Lives Matter protests have swept the nation as demonstrators demand justice in response to the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Avri, and locally Tahisa Miller in Riverside, and recently still under investigation, Robert Fuller of Palmdale and Malcolm Hirsch of Victorville, and far too many other blacks to list because the killing of black men and women, including queer trans persons of color, is an unacceptable violation of God-given inalienable human rights due to all people. And whereas the Black Lives Matter movement, like the civil rights and the black power movement before it, have effectively articulated the injustices that exist at the intersections of race, class and gender, ability, religion, and sexual orientation, including mass incarceration, police brutality, poverty, unaffordable housing, human income disparity, homophobia, gender inequality, poor access to healthcare, and education outcomes. And finally, whereas in a 2019 Pew Center survey, 84% of black adults said that in dealing with police, black people are generally treated less fairly than whites, and 87% of blacks and 61% of whites said that the US criminal justice system treats black people less fairly and differently, and there are over 1,800 black residents in Ukaipa, therefore be it resolved that the members that make up the organization known as the Ukaipa Calamasa Democratic Club stand with Black Lives Matter and against the systematic killing, abuse, and racism embedded in our local government of Ukaipa, San Bernardino County, and nationwide, and call for an immediate change away from the paramilitary policing and tactics that include needless, lethal aggression, and violence towards black people, people of color, and all Mr. The Westwood, your time is up. I'm going to give you the- Mr. Westwood, your time is up. Unanimously passed by the members of the Ukaipa Calamasa Democratic Club. I'm reading something that is three Mr. Sentences Westwood, up. your time is up. If you can, you can just give it to- um, uh, They asked to, for 11 copies, so I, I don't have it in the minutes. Okay, we can, we can get it at a different time. Please oblige me and put it in the minutes. You Thank can you. put it in the minutes. Thank you. All righty, uh, next is Marion Lovelace. On deck is Grace McCray and Mike McHugh. I'm Marion Lovelace, Acacia Avenue, Yucaipa, California. Um, issues from last year have cropped up again regarding Councilman Duncan. I would like to set the record straight. He did make some social media comments, but they were not Muslims and immigrants. They were radical Muslims who are evil and illegal immigrants. He still has the right for free speech. Right now, it's still America. Now, in regards to everybody asking for resignations, that's not how it works, people. In November, we are having an election. 
Mr. Duncan's seat is up. If you are in his district, you have an option, yes or no. If you don't live in his district, just check on your own council district. As far as asking the mayor to ask for his resignation, mm -hmm. I don't think that's in your job description. I could be wrong. He has done nothing to warrant it. This is America. You put your voice at the ballot box. And if I were in Councilman Duncan's district, he would have my vote in a heartbeat. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Grace McCray. Hello, my name is Grace McCray, and I'll be speaking uh, the rest of the written response written by Mr. Mike Rainey. Councilman Duncan, your actions on June 1st and your words since then have been especially concerning to many in our community. Our own Yukaipa Police Department stated there was no credible threat to our city from outside groups, yet you said there was. As a leader, your words bear fruit. On June 1st, we needed words that promoted reasonable dialogue, not aggression towards people who have a different point of view. You said you had a right to display your firearm in public. The district, the district attorney countered what you said, so you had to issue a statement in response. Why is your statement now removed from the website? It is not important for our community to have clarity about the laws governing firearms. Do, is it not important for our community to have clarity about the laws governing firearms? Do we want members of our community disregarding laws governing firearms? Another concerning thing was that one of your members last week mentioned that you, Councilman Duncan, have a group of 6,000 supporters in the Ukaipa Strong Facebook group. To be honest, that sounded like a threat. What kind of support do we want our city council members to have? I've interacted with this Facebook group. Some members were interested in engaging in constructive conversation. Some members frightened me. Just this last week, two, posts, two concerning posts were supporting inviting the murderer of George Floyd to Ukaipa for a barbecue and conflated a Nazi hand signal salute as a solution to the Black Lives Matter movement. That kind of speech should have no home in Ukaipa, especially in a group that claims to support a councilman. Our leaders need to stand up against any rallying cry that will bring harm to others, regardless of whose group they are a part of. This group has, turned, uh, has been turning a blind eye to hate speech and misinformation within our own community. Does that concern you? As a, as a Christian and as an American, this caliber of content disgusts me and makes me concerned for this community. Who supports you says a lot about your values. Finally, you stated you would do it again. I want to believe your actions were motivated by care for this community. What if you took that same care for the community and extended a listening ear to those who see a need for change and took the time to understand why your actions are so inappropriate and alarming? We're not Antifa outsiders. We're your neighbors. I know I stand by mem many members of this community when I ask all of you leaders to take these concerns seriously. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mike McHugh, and on deck is Regina Tierney and Faith Cords, and we go ahead and add Ryan Calbreth. Uh, real quickly, this lady right here and this lady right here in the back pretty much said everything I had to say, but I just want uh, to say that my son was actually protesting. He didn't know. He was called in by a couple friends, and uh, they went down to protest, and uh, he was on the receiving end of some racism, and I was a little embarrassed. Um, but like this lady said here, there was a few bad apples that reflected on all of us, because the news covered that, and that's the only thing they covered. It was all over the news, and it reflected bad on all of us, including Bobby Duncan. Um, the important thing was we didn't have any property damage, and like she said, there was a lot of fear going on, because all we see on the news is people's livelihoods being destroyed and their lives being destroyed and worse. So um, I stand with Bobby Duncan and I'm glad that uh, there was no incidences. You had thousands of armed people protecting their property, using their God-given rights as citizens. And we had no incidences with the exception of a few bad apples. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, Regina Tierney, and uh, I'm a recent uh, transplant into California from New Jersey into Yucaipa. Uh, cancer is one of the top five leading causes of death in the U.S., second only to heart disease. There are five top cancers in the U.S. last year, according to Cancer.net and the American Cancer Society. They are skin cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, colorectal cancer. And if you add all of those cancers, the top five, that's almost four million cancers diagnosed per year. Now, sarcomas are rare cancers that develop in the bones and soft tissues. They include fat, muscle, blood vessels, nerves, deep skin tissues, and fibrous tissues. And according to the National Cancer Institute, about 12,000 cases are soft sarcomas and 3,000 are bone sar sarcomas, and they're diagnosed per year. That's only 15,000 sarcomas out of 4 million of the five most common cancers. And I didn't even mention the other 100 or so other cancers that I'm sure you've heard of some of them, but there are others that are rare. My son was diagnosed with soft tissue sarcoma in December of 2008. That cancer took his life two years later. I had never heard of sarcomas before his diagnosis, but I became acutely aware of it immediately upon that diagnosis. So what does this have to do with anything today? Just because you're not aware of something, that does not mean it doesn't exist. Just because its existence has not impacted your life does not mean that you can ignore it. Just because you haven't personally experienced something does not mean that it hasn't caused pain and heartache for someone else. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much for your comments. Faith Cords. Hi, thank you. Um, Faith Cords. Um, my husband and I are here to support Bobby Duncan and vote against his resignation. It is people like Bobby who stood strong, steadfast against any possible tyranny and domestic violence here. The Antifa and BLM, BLM are masterminds of domestic violence, guys. We were, in fact, felt threatened to this town. And like everybody says, it was our defense to show that we, we were going to stand up for ourselves. You know, unfortunately, these people pretend to be peaceful, and they mix themselves in with peaceful protesters. But they create havoc, chaos, and destruction. Are we not seeing this? Without the town folk that stood here on the rooftops, rooftops with their right to bear arms to protect their businesses, we would have truly had a serious town torn to pieces. Rioters received the message. That's why we didn't get any, guys. It said, don't go to Yucaipa. Bobby proved to us that he believes in this town and is willing to protect it at all costs. That kind of character is who we want to continue to help this community stay safe and stay strong. Last comment. If your feelings were hurt by seeing Bobby and all the other businesses stand up for themselves, for freedom, against tyranny, then maybe you should find a town that will allow it to be destroyed in the name of protesting. Our rights don't end because it hurts your feelings. Thank you. Okay, Ryan. Cold breath? Uh, hi, my name is Ryan Calvreth. My family has given uh, 150 years of service to the local public schools of this area. And there is absolutely no question, as the actions of B Mr. Bobby Duncan uh, demonstrate, that we have a massive issue with white supremacy and an ignorance around the history of this country and racism therein. I call upon you to resign, sir. I call upon the other members of this council to agree with that call and call upon him to resign. Anyone who does not join this call is aiding and abetting white supremacy in this city. Uh, a lot of talk about violence from these folks here 
And once again, the very basic principle here is, of course, that the violence is in the police. The violence is in the way that law enforcement was founded and has always existed in this country. And anyone who is, you know, maybe getting a little rowdy, burning down some buildings here and there, that is in response to the violence that they live in every single day. I uh, truly hope that you will do the right thing and step down and uh, maybe do some reflection and live up to the values on that wall behind you in God. Shh. He has his time. Be respectful of him. Okay, if you continue to talk, I'll ask you to be removed. I'll ask. I will not watch that. That's disgusting. We need to have her removed if she does not continue to talk. Thank you. He's a public servant, ma'am. This is how it works. Okay, I. Uh, you have 40 seconds left. Please use them wisely. Of course, of course. Thank you. Uh, so, please, let's have her just escort her out, please. Sweet, thanks. Just real fast. Everybody has a constitutional right to express themselves, whether you agree or disagree. Oh man, yeah, I agree. The, Demo the Democratic Party is absolutely part of the problem. I, I, I wholeheartedly support that because they're. Uh, Compliance with white supremacy is also, you know, why we're at where we're at. Anyways, um, so yeah, live up to the values of the words behind you. In God we trust. You're not loving your neighbor if you don't stand with black people. You're not loving your neighbor if you don't protect brown people. Uh, and I'm sure at one point you all preached about fiscal conservancy. I'm sure you're all very, like, you know, conservative people. Uh, you're burying the city in debt you're, by a million dollars or more every single year by the check that you run to the San, San Bernardino County Police Department, even though there's a hundred volunteers that you know lick boots and come out and help out the cops every day. So uh, I really, really, really want you to resign, sir, and you're in a complete embarrassment to me and everyone here. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, that's uh, it for the live speakers. Um, Jennifer, we have a number of written comments. Would you like to enter them into the record, please? And they get two minutes also. First one, Rebecca Gamble. I'm writing to you in response to the city council member, Bobby Duncan. I do not support his actions on Yucaipa Boulevard on the night of protecting our businesses in June, on June 1st. I watched the videos in live feed as it unfolded all night long. The parking lot was filled with drunken and disorderly people with weapons. They instigated and provoked hate and aggressive militia behavior against less than 20 young protesters. Although they believe they had good intentions, they disrupted law and order in our city, and I'm not proud of their behavior. Bobby Duncan should be held to a higher standard as a representative of the city. Thank you, Yukaipa Police Department, for your continued priority to law and order. Thank you, City Council, for reviewing this disturbance and attempting to rectify the behavior of a few individuals that ruin it for the rest. Our city will come together after the face of disappointment. Please continue to reprimand the offenders. I appreciate your consideration in the matter. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Deborah Savit, and she has uh, submitted two public comments. So she has two minutes. Okay. Um, okay. I'm an elected official of the San Bernardino County Central Democratic Committee. Uh, Mayor Avila, on June 2nd, you issued an executive proc and ordered pro proclaiming the existence of a local and civil emergency to adopt limitations on alcoholic beverages in open containers on public property, non-residential property, parking areas of the city to suppress disturbance, violence, and destruction of property. This was in reference to the June 1st attack on the peaceful BLM protesters in Yucaipa. There is no, absolutely no discussion in your executive proc or any reference to the open carry of firearms, knives, nor any reference to the violence that occurred on June 1st that was inflicted upon peaceful BLM protesters by counter protesters wearing MAGA hats and Yucaipa strong t-shirts looking for any reason to terrorize, inflict harm and pain 
to innocent protesters due to fake news threats to local businesses, possi possibly from Antifa. This is one of the dangers of social media that agitators are putting out misinformation to create a reason to commit violence. I am appalled and disturbed that your proclamation appears to be mild, slap on the hands of the white supremacists and MAGA groups that do not, dr do not allow drinking in public spaces. You are blatantly sweeping these serious issues of racial hatred under the rug. If people of color were carrying weapons that evening and walked across the street spouting out hate speech and beat up a young woman and man, would they receive the same light slap on the hand? I am sure they would be in jail right now with full police department investigations with white people screaming for justice. By not addressing this very serious issue, Avila and town council members, you are giving license for white supremacist group to flourish and become more emboldened in the city of Ukaipa. I would like to address Bobby Duncan personally. You are an elected official representing all members of the city of Ukaipa. This includes all people of skin colors and cultural diversity. As a community leader, you should not be hanging out with vigilantes. Okay. Wrap it up real fast. Finish sentence. I can't. Finish. Okay. Two, two more pages. All righty. The next speaker requested that I not state their name into record. I think, is that legal? I don't think so. Perhaps the city attorney would like to weigh in on it, but my recommendation is if, if the person doesn't want to give their name, then I don't think that we're obligated to hear the comment. David, do you have a, is that, it's up to you. Thank you. Uh, I, I would agree that, that uh, we would not need to um, read that into the record this evening. I'm, so she can speak without giving her name or his name? Yes, Mr. Mayor, that, that would be a rule for anyone who came into the council chambers uh, themselves. They could fill out a speaker slip and say, you know, fill in a, an alternate name. They're not compelled to provide their name. So um, I suggest we, we treat, based on the request, um, this uh, uh, letter the same way. Okay, I, as I understand it, she can be, she can't have her two minutes without a name. Okay, uh, no name. I speak to you today as a concerned resident of Ukaipa. The lack of clear direction to address racism in this town is disheartening, as is the fact that Councilmember Duncan, Mayor Avila, and the police department have still not condemned and issued any sort of citation, arrest, or fines for the illegal open carry of weapons on Ukaipa city streets that took place on June 1st. This is despite this dis District Attorney Jason Anderson's clearly stated of June 10th clearly stating of June 10th that this is against the law to protect property with firearms. And this is despite the fact that the Ukaipa Police Department discredited any social media threats to this town on the 1st, a story covered in today's New York Times. I have two main points to express. First, the defense of being scared for why individuals gather to protect the city is ludicrous. You can see the party atmosphere in the videos and photos, and it must be acknowledged that bio biologically, fear hijacks the brain and leads to illogical and irrational behavior. Second, this is a casebook example of white privilege. The so-called Ukaipa militia and the Ukaipa Police Department has been able to use being scared and ignorance of complicated laws as an excuse to condone firearm violations, drinking alcohol from open containers, and verbally intimidating and physically assaulting Black Lives Matter protesters on June 1st. The luxury of using ignorance and fear to get you off the hook for illegal behavior is not afforded to the people of color in this country. You are aware that black parents routinely have conversations with their young children to tell them the importance of staying calm in tense situations. This is because black bodies are unfairly associated with criminality and violence. If a person of color reacts irrationally in a situation with law enforcement because they are scared, they are likely to get themselves shot because someone with a gun or a taser assumes they are dangerous. That was your time. Concern citizen number two. I would like to address Council Member Bobby Duncan. Over the years, Mr. Duncan, you and your devote friends and associates have professed a sincere love and support of law enforcement. If this is true, then why did you encourage others to join you with firearms and alcohol on the evening and night of June 1st? Did you think that drunken armed citizens were safer for the city than the law enforcement that you love and support so much? Did you think that drunken armed citizens breaking the law 
in countless ways, including assaulting peaceful protesters were going to be of help? Did you not think that drunken armed citizens might get in the way of keeping the law and order in the city? Did you not think that law enforcement would handle the job? Mr. Duncan, if you want law and order, then follow the law, but you didn't. You've, you've said that you won't in the future, shame on you. Mr. Duncan, you also have professed both your love of the city and love of your God. There is much debate over your genuine concern for the residents of the city compared to your concern for the few that you seem to base most of your decisions on. However, that can be debated for weeks to come or as long as you were in office. As a result of ongoing debate, I want to address your faith in God. You claim to be a religious man, and with that claim comes assumption that you in you are a man of high morals, as most religious people should be, yet your decision-making leaves much to be desired, not only in the eyes of the general public, but also in the eyes of God, who you claim to have a close relationship with. Let me ask you this. Should a man with high morals, such as you claim to be, encourage and incite people to break the law in the city he represents while in a position of power and in the city that is supposedly so near and dear to his heart? What would your God say? Based on your actions, it's obvious that your God would say that you have no morals. Can I hear an amen? I would like to, to address Mayor Avila. Mayor, as a member of the Rotary Club, you are supposed to be a leader who sees, and I quote, a, word, a world where people unite and take action to create long-lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. Our leaders as Rotary at Rotary, Reggie Tierney, um, as a newer resident of the city, I have grave concerns about the events that took place in the Uptown on June 1st. I've been following the, the latest developments in the news and on social media, and while there have been some positive outcomes as a result of the attention, more needs to be done. The city must take a strong, in, strong stance against both racism. On June 9th, the County Board of Supervisors declared racism a public health crisis. The city of Yucaipa needs to not only do the same, but also demand an inquiry and establish a task force to address issues of systemic racism and racial injustice in the city. Well, I am glad to see the clarification of city ordinances on public drinking, what is being done to address violations of California gun laws with the ban to, on open, to care, uh, open carry. I believe the city should respond in a similar manner and publicly clarify what is and what is not allowed under the penal code and public forums, including social media and on the city's web page. In response to those who say that the actions of June 1st were necess necessitated by fear and the desire to protect the city and its business, I have some questions. First, if you care about protecting business and the city, why were you, so many people at the city last city council meeting without a mask and without social distancing in the midst of a pandemic? How can you claim you are motivated by the need to protect Yucaipa when you won't even wear a simple mask in public, which is strongly recommended by all local, state, and federal public agencies? My second question is, if you are one of the people who think COVID is a hoax, why would you not apply that same discernment to the proven hoax perpetuated against small towns and cities around the county by white nationalist and white supremacist group that imaginary busloads of Antifa looters were coming to Yucaipa. Finally, how can you claim to support law enforcement but not trust the sheriff's deputies to do their jobs? If you reacted to unsubstantiated threats on social media, the correct response would have been to report those threats to law enforcement. Rebecca Lockney, my name is Rebecca Lockney, I've been a resident of Yucaipa for 39 years. The letter is, intent, is in regards to the events that took place on June 1st in Uptown Yucaipa. Councilmember Duncan ran his campaign with the slogan, one of the, pe one of the people for the people. Wow, he sure is a man of his word. On the evening of Monday, June 1st, Councilmember Duncan did just that. He stood shoulder to shoulder with the citizens of the city and fulfilled the promise he made to be one of the people for the people. Let's also clarify that Duncan was not drawn by the art was not down by the Arco station where some where one fight took place. He was peacefully sitting in a lawn chair out in front of Brukaipa. Thank you, Councilmember Duncan, for standing up for our city and supporting its business and citizens. Had the citizens and Councilmember Duncan not done what they did that night, we may be having a whole other conversation, possibly trying to find emergency funds to rebuild up town. I support Bobby Duncan. Thank you. Brenda Urbahim. 
The city of Yucaipa is being terrorized by vigilantes who haven't yet figured out what they out that they were the victims of a national-wide hoax perpetuated ironically by far white supremacist groups during the early days of the Black Lives Matter and the anti-police brutality protest. It is common knowledge that the reports of busloads of looters bound for smaller cities and rural towns across the country did not constitute credible threats. It was laughable scenario then and has since been completely debunked by the FBI and local law enforcement agencies. YPD and council, per their own admissions, were aware that the threats were not credible well before the night of June 1st. Despite this knowledge, members of the council not only neglected to uh, assuage the fears of the public, but allegedly in encouraged and participated in the event vigilantism since that night that led to the violent assault of several peaceful protesters. Even with the knowledge that no real threat ever existed, that the behavior of several business owners and residents violated city and state penal codes, and that severe injuries were inflicted upon peaceful citizens as they exercised their rights to gather and protest, city leadership has not publicly condemned the behavior of the violent mob of self-proclaimed protesters of the city. Rather than admonishing this group of community terrorists, the council actually congratulated them for their behavior. One member of this council appears to have actually joined forces with them. Bobby Duncan is a member of several pages that celebrate the hateful and illicit behavior of June 1st, and even suggested to a fellow group member on the Ukaipa Strong page that the photo of himself violating California anti-open carry laws should be widely shared as he is running for re-election and he needs all the publicity he can get. Again, Bobby Duncan proves his unfitness for office. He has no shame, so he would never do the honorable thing and resign. I've received three public comments that came in after the three o'clock deadline today. Would you like me to read them? Yes, please. Aaron Chand Chanadet. I have known Bobby Duncan a good deal of my life. I've been friends with his kids for nearly 40 years, so I believe that lets me know his character. Bobby always worked two to three jobs to make sure his kids had everything they needed. He wanted his wife home with children, so he did what was necessary. But beyond his kids, he has always made sure that any kid around was included. He took us to restaurants, Knott's Berry Farm movies, places that a lot of small town kids' parents can't afford or never thought to do. I am absolutely sure in my heart Bobby Duncan would take in anybody regardless of their ethnicity, gender, religion, or sexual orientation and treat them like family as I was. Irene Phelan, I have known, Duncan, I have known the Duncan family for 35 years. They are wonderful, caring people. I can't imagine how much anyone could accuse them of being prejudiced or unkind in any, any way. Norma Rosemond. I would like to let you know that Duncan is a very honest and caring man. He strives to always go home and be, go above and beyond. His character is one of integrity, courage, loyalty, and fortitude. I do believe that Bobby Duncan cares for everybody, and he does not discriminate based on gender, sexual orientation, race, or religion. Mr. Duncan's courage is a key to good leadership and enables him to do or say what is true, honest, and brave, even if doing so makes him unpopular. That's all I have. Thank you. We also have two late um, requests to speak, and these will be the last two. First one is Damian Ross. Mr. Ross, you have two minutes. I, I wrote it down on my phone. Hi, I'm Damian Ross, a resident of Ukaipa. I would like to discuss the matter of Bobby Duncan and the slander that's been thrown against our city. First, I'd like to address the matter of Mr. Duncan's actions. I would like to say I'm proud of the bravery you had to stand with your community. You've seen a threat and took action. Our founding father, George Washington, would be proud of the man you are. He himself stood side by side with his fellow people in battle, even David stood against defeating Goliath and protecting his people. Bobby Duncan is a man of God and simply showed up 
to stand up for his people with his people from a threat that could have been very serious. Some say the threat wasn't serious, but as a former resident of San Bernardino, when a threat is made, it's more of a promise than a threat. I grew up through rough neighborhoods where drive-by shootings, violence, and white sheets were normal. My wife and I didn't want the same for our kids. I appreciate all who stood in arms to protect our community. And to the rest, I shall say, don't point out the speck in your brother's eye when you got a log hanging out your own. This town isn't racist, it's cautious. Thank you, you keep us strong. Our last speaker is Steve. Thank you. Um, Mr. Duncan, this is the first time you have looked up from your phone, from scrolling through your phone for the past 40 minutes. You haven't looked at a speaker supporting you. You haven't looked at a supporter disagreeing with you. Same with the public comments that were written in, that were emailed in. You've been scrolling through your phone. I need, I need you to think. You're representing the city. This is a city meeting. Do you care? You're not even showing you care. Thank you. OK, we've gone all the way through all the public comments. We'll move on to the consent agenda. Actually, I, I do have a request. I, um, I would like to uh, hear an update from Captain Williams um, because I think that people don't realize that there is an, and has been at the direction of uh, this uh, city an investigation going on uh, related to the events on June 1st. And I'm hoping that our captain can give us an update on where we're at with that investigation. Any objections on council? Okay, no objections. Captain Williams. Good evening. Uh, I can report that our detectives have completed uh, the, at least the initial phase of the investigation into the uh, activity or the, the violence that occurred in front of the ARCO station. Uh, we have forwarded those reports today to the district attorney uh, recommending some charges and uh, it will now be on the district attorney to make a charging decision and then inform us uh, of their decision so that we can move forward on to the next steps. But I should also mention the investigation is still technically open and anyone who has information uh, regarding potential suspects, any additional victims that we're not aware of uh, can contact uh, Detective Madrill at the Akaipa Police Department, and he will uh, follow up on any leads that are provided. Thank you, Captain. Okay. Now we'll move on to the consent agenda. Are there any items wish that any council member wish to have removed for discussion? Seeing none, do I have a motion to accept to move forward the consent? So move. I'll second. And we have a first and a second. Any further discussion? Jennifer, we take the roll call vote, please. Councilmember Riddell? Aye. Councilmember Bogue? Aye. Councilmember Duncan? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Allen? Aye. Mayor Avila? Yes. Okay, moving on. Mayor and Councilmember business reports. Anything to declare from? Council member, nothing? No, I just want to um, uh, state that I did go to the um, candlelight vigil that was uh, coordinated by our mayor, and I want to commend him for his efforts to start a process and to provide an opportunity for people to come together and have some you know, thoughts to help us move through this uh, situation that we currently are in, in fact, nationwide. And I just want to, um, you know, it takes a lot of time to put an event like that together. And I just want to make sure that uh, he uh, hears that it was appreciated. It was a nice event, well organized. So thank you again. Okay, anything else? Nothing, okay. Um, moving forward, 
fiscal year 2019 2020 community activity grant accountability reports just for the record mr mayor i don't have any uh, items for uh, oh i'm sorry the actions this evening so no, nothing on that okay jennifer Yes, sorry, uh, Mayor and Council. Just uh, this is the accountability reports for the both financial and in-kind grants uh, that were awarded in fiscal year 1920. Staff has reviewed the wrap-up reports and are recommending that you receive the accountability reports and deem the program requirements met by the agencies listed in the staff report. That's it. Very good. Are there any questions of staff? Any comments? I'll move the item. Um, is this a receive and file kind of thing? I believe it is. Um, I would prefer an action on this. It's not just a receive and file. Okay. I'll second. We have a first and a second. Any further discussion on the item? Hearing none, Jennifer, recall roll call vote, please. Councilmember Riddell? Aye. Councilmember Bogue? Aye. Councilmember Duncan? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Allen? Aye. Mayor Avila? Yes. Okay, possible action on pending legislation. Is there anything to report? No, my apologies. That was, you had the right order. Nothing to report this evening, Mr. For Mayor. once, I got it right. <laughs> and I had it wrong. <laughs> okay, uh, now we're coming up for department reports. First, number 18, Community Services Department reopening plan. And that would be Ms. Johnson. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. On June 12th, 2020, the County of San Bernardino moved into phase three of the reopening plan per the governor's approval. Staff is recommending the following for the community services department. Continue with the phased reopening of the Ukaipa Community Center, Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. for drop-in basketball, pickleball, and racquetball, and registration for summer camp. Next, reopen the Sure Community Center on July 6th, Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. at a 50% occupancy for limited drop-in programming such as bingo, computer lab, and also to serve as a cooling center. Next is approve concerts in the park to begin on Sunday, J July 19th at the Community Park Amphitheater. Concerts will continue for five consecutive weeks until August 16th and there will be social distancing circles um, that we will chalk in the grass for families or people who live in the same household, and those circles will be six feet apart. Next, approve outdoor concerts in, at the Uptown Park beginning August 7th with similar COVID-19 related measures. And finally, authorize staff to reopen other programs, classes, and services as approved by the county and or governor's orders. The Ukaipa Performing Arts Center will remain closed at this time as such gatherings are still not permitted in phase three of the reopening plan. However, in an effort to bring customers to the uptown um, businesses, staff is recommending to host Friday Night Live beginning August 7th. If approved, this event will be an eight week live local entertainment series from six to 9 p.m. on the YPAC outdoor stage. This idea was shared with the Uptown Association at their June 16th meeting and they supported the concept. The series will include a partnership with uptown businesses, local bands playing live music, and lim limited seating will be provided with social distancing in place. All expenditures related to this item are included in the fiscal year 2019, 2020, and 2020, 2021 budget. The staff is recommending that council approve all these recommendations as listed in the staff report on page 469. And that concludes my report, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Very good. Thank you. Any questions of staff? No, I just have a comment. Are you going to have like a flyer that goes out for the uh, Friday Night Live? Yes. Okay, because I, I think that's perfect. It's succinct, and it, I think it says what we want to have happen, and I'm really happy to see that coming back along with our concerts in our parks. So keep up the good work. Yes, thank you very much. Any other comments or questions of staff? I'll move the item. Okay, we have a motion to accept, uh, to move the item. I'll second. And a second from Council Member Bogue. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Jennifer, roll call vote, please. Council Member Riddell? Aye. Council Member Bogue? Aye. Council Member Duncan? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Allen? Aye. Mayor Avila? Yes. 
Okay, item number 19, monthly, monthly treasurer's report. Thank July you, Mr. 2019, 2020. Yes, sir. Sorry, jumped the gun there. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. This item is, as you said, monthly treasurer's report from July 2019 through May 2020. Uh, with a number of our uh, efforts, uh, uh, we, we got a little behind in, in uh, treasurer's report, bank reconciliation policies, bond reconciliation policies, et cetera. One by one, we are catching up. Uh, I want to give uh, Ryan uh, Blackerby, our uh, finance manager, credit for uh, helping us get caught up with the treasurer's report. Uh, this covers that time period that I uh, talked about. Um, and uh, basically, a treasurer's report uh, shows uh, the progress of our portfolio and uh, our account balances uh, over time. And going forward, it will come to you on a monthly basis as a receive and file, as this is a receive and file this, this evening. Uh, that's the end of the report. Uh, Ryan and I are both available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions of staff? No, this is a little ahead of when you said it was going to be done. So I just want to send an applause. So way to go. Yes. Anything else? Okay, this is a receive and file. So we'll go ahead and move on to um, number 20, which is the DIF loan repayment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll take this one as well. Um, and again, Ryan is here as well uh, for any questions you may have. As a council may, be, uh, may recall, um, over the last several years, there have been some uh, discussions uh, in this, this year resulting in our audit this past year and uh, uh, conversation relative to our uh, ongoing practice of um, loaning uh, from net revenues from previous years, uh, general, general fund net revenues from previous years, uh, for priority projects in the community. This is a practice that goes back to actually started with the community center and, and uh, that ended up being grant funded, but uh, went on to uh, uh, City Hall, a fire station, police station, uh, several transportation projects, including uh, the Live Oak Interchange, and of course, uh, the YPAC. Uh, all of that has resulted in a total uh, amount owed uh, to the general fund from development impact fees of about uh, $22 million. Uh, and although uh, re uh, reimbursements have been made over the years, um, uh, not uh, uh, in, in the amounts that uh, uh, our auditor would be comfortable with, Number one, number two, uh, the loan repayment um, uh, was felt that a, a formalized agreement should be in place. Uh, and number three, it was felt that a horizon uh, should be established. Um, and so what, what we have before you is a recommendation from staff and also the finance committee uh, uh, such that 50% uh, of all DIF uh, revenues on an annual basis uh, be repaid to uh, be used to uh, fund the repayment uh, to the loan of the loan to the general fund um, beyond whatever development agreement uh, uh, might be in place for a particular project. So a particular project perhaps would have a, could have a development agreement in place for diff eligible adjacent infrastructure to be built. Uh, so beyond that, any net revenues would be 50% reimbursed to the general fund. If there is no uh, development agreement uh, and no uh, infrastructure necessary to support the project uh, that the developer would participate in, then 50% uh, of all uh, DIF proceeds uh, would uh, be used to reimburse the, uh, the general fund. Uh, the reason for Horizon is uh, just that, to, to uh, have an end date, if you will. And so uh, at the end of 10 years, uh, the uh, loan agreement uh, and this uh, uh, staff report would call for uh, whatever uh, is remaining in that loan amount uh, would be uh, would be written off. Uh, that's another way of uh, kind of reducing development impact fees if we do get to that point, uh, which is something that uh, council had talked about along the way. Uh, in the short term, it certainly is going to be helpful for the general fund, um, and uh, certainly that's a something that is of uh, a benefit in this current uh, COVID-19 re uh, recession uh, time period and public safety issues that we are confronted with. Uh, and in the uh, midterm, we're still able to, um, uh, as council has uh, discussed in, in recent council meetings, uh, we're still able to make progress on some of the priority projects if 50% of the DIF funding goes to projects like UKIPA Boulevard, like Avenue E, like uh, County Line Road and others that, uh, 
are uh, partially funded now and, and uh, uh, we seek to uh, finish over the next several years. So there is some benefit uh, to having 50% uh, of the uh, diff funding, the net diff funding going to uh, uh, projects as well. Uh, with that, uh, staff is recommending that the council adopt resolution number 2020-43, approving the interfund loan agreement between the city's general fund and various developer fee funds and authorize and direct the city manager to execute said agreement. And I guess I would like to say one other thing. With the uh, council approving uh, skip financing for projects, we actually have one or two projects, one that is moving through the process right now, and there's a decent chance that that uh, will result uh, in that project uh, starting, and that skip financing would come at the beginning of the project. It's actually already been graded. It just finished the grading uh, here recently. And um, the estimate for that project is somewhere in a, the neighborhood of a million four, a million five in development impact fees. And so under this agreement, uh, if approved tonight, uh, half of that would go to the general fund, just as an example. Okay, very good. Thank you for that report. Any questions of staff? Any comments? The only, con the the only concern that I had was the percent. I was just... I know that's something that we've wanted to pay back for over time, and 50% seems like it might. I don't want to go to 100%, but I think, I don't know. Explain to me why we're doing the 50 and try to justify. I mean, just. It's a great question. Um, we started at a smaller percentage and, and um, talked about 100%. 50% is a policy decision. Uh, again, um, it, it comes down to how much we want to prioritize some of these other projects that are um, that are not fully funded yet, and it could be 75, it could be 25, but we, it was, it's really a policy decision for council to to consider. I just see that 22 million dollars, and it's it's going to take a while to pay that back. So, the smaller the number, the longer it takes. I guess we can start with 50. I'm, I'm okay with that. I just Do you have know a counter proposal? Do we have some sense yet of how much we're going to be losing based on all this COVID thing that's going on? Do we have some sense of that? Yeah, and uh, good question. I mean, in the reality. But, I'm sorry. In the yeah, in the budget study session, um, uh, the initial budget study session, we talked about the HDL forecast for sales tax. And uh, the, the estimate at the time uh, was uh, that uh, this current fiscal year, we would lose 15% compared to 18-19. And then 2021, next fiscal year, uh, we would lose 15%. It would be very similar to what they're estimating for this fiscal year. Property taxes, a slight increase, uh, we still think. But uh, basically, sales tax would, would be 15% less than fiscal year 18-19, $600,000 and some change. Do you think this governor is going to shut us down again? That's a tough question. I, I sure hope not. I sure hope not. I, I sure hope we all uh, are following guidelines to the point where we can kind of mitigate uh, all of that and and uh, uh, and not shut us down again. And he not shut us down again. So that's that's my hope. I just I, sorry. Are you finished? Mm -hmm. Can I? I just want to make sure that we're not just grabbing the 50% because that's just the number that is just thrown out there and it actually is something that's going to help us pay this back and and, so, and bring that and bring that yeah. that, num that number down. If I may, um, it was a good comment I heard, I think. Um, uh, the auditors would not be uh, at all, they would not object, I don't believe, to increasing the loan amount next year from 50% to 75% or the year after, whenever council wishes to reconsider that, if, if you do. Um, and you could start at 50% and bump it up to 75% next year if you didn't see enough of a revenue coming in uh, from, this, uh, uh, from this loan program. That's certainly an option. How does, uh, I mean, our... Uh long-term expert on development impact fees is uh, on the phone. So what do, you, what do you think, Dick, about the 50%? Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, can me? Yes, sir. I think 50% is a good place to start. And the fact that uh, Misty Chang uh, went all went for it, that helps convince me. So I think 50% is a good place to start. I'm just glad that we initiated or initiating a program 
to see that this money goes back to uh, uh, paying off the general fund. Because that thing was just climbing and climbing with uh, no guarantee that it would ever be paid back. I mean, you could get so far extended that you'd never pay it back. But I think 50% is a good place to start to see how it works out. Like uh, Ray said for the first year, if it's not getting paid back rapidly enough, we can increase it next year to 75 or I doubt if we'd ever want to go to 100, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, okay with the 50%. I'm just glad we got a program set up to pay it back. I'm okay. convinced. He's convinced me. Oh, yeah. no, okay. I'll start with 50. It's a good starting point okay. because we can always come back, review it, and if we need to raise it, we certainly can. Like you said, I'll, it's a policy decision. I'll second his motion then. Okay, we have a first and a second. Do we have any further discussion? Hearing none, Jennifer, you take roll call vote, please. Councilmember Riddell? Aye. Councilmember Bogue? Aye. Councilmember Duncan? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Allen? Aye. Mayor Avila? Yes. Okay, moving on to item number 21, amended letter of intent to purchase the proposed 140 lots within track map 2130 with Woodside, et cetera, et cetera. And that is Mr. Casey again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as you referenced, this is a, an amended letter of intent that uh, uh, council heard here recently, the original letter of intent. Uh, and basically, it's a kind of a stopgap measure that provides the same value to the project as the original letter of intent. Original letter of intent uh, had a, a higher purchase price at about nine and a half million, uh, which was to be used entirely for the uh, basin and, and channel improvements uh, adjacent to the uh, residential development. This is a change that lowers that purchase price to 8.1 million uh, in that range and makes up the difference in uh, development impact fees, including a uh, skip financing, which means the funding would come to the project at the beginning of the project. And so it's intended to uh, uh, make the project, uh, the city and the project, uh, uh, infrastructure project whole. Uh, and the reason is that it's gonna take a little bit longer than uh, we uh, anticipated for them to work through the community facilities district with the school district for uh, school fees, taking out the uh, uh, tier, I think it's tier one uh, uh, costs and, and lowering those costs. Uh, they are working with the school district, actively uh, working with the school district on a, a MOU for that. Uh, but this is a way to make sure that uh, we can move forward with the uh, project uh, and that the financing, the funding uh, for the infrastructure project adjacent to, adjacent to the residential project uh, stays whole, if you will, compared to the original letter of intent. Uh, so the development agreement is coming to you uh, July 8th uh, in a special meeting uh, with a second reading July 13th. Um, uh, we are moving ahead with the uh, grading uh, contract for the city yard to give you an update on that part uh, and bringing that to council July 8th as well, right? Um, uh, and uh, some other moving parts you'll see over the next couple of uh, city council meetings as well. So we are moving forward. They're uh, uh, in, in agreement with these changes to the LOI and uh, uh, happy to answer any questions uh, you may have uh, relative to the item. Staff's recommending uh, that you approve the actions in the item uh, before you this evening. All right, thank you, sir. Any questions or comments of staff? Nothing? Mr. Riddell, do you have any questions or comments? No questions. Okay. I'll move the item. Second. We have a first and a second to approve. If no further discussion, Jennifer, roll call vote, please. Councilmember Riddell? Aye. Councilmember Bogue? Aye. Councilmember Duncan? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Allen? Aye. Mayor Avila? Yes. Okay, um, we're going ahead and I'm adjourn the city council meeting and give the chair to council member Bogue. I will open the successor agency and the first item of business are the meeting minutes of June 8th. Move the item. Second. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Jennifer, can you call the roll? Or do Bo you guys want to discuss them? <laughs> okay. Board member Riddell? Aye. This is a successor agency. Yeah. Okay. 
Board member Avila? Yes. Board member Duncan? Aye. Vice Chairperson Allen? Aye. Chairperson Bogue? Aye. So I will now adjourn the successor agency and open the housing authority and we have the meeting minutes of June 8th. Move the item. Second. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Jennifer, will you call the roll? Commissioner Riddell? Aye. Commissioner Avila? Yes. Commissioner Duncan? Aye. Vice Chairperson Allen? Aye. Chairperson Bogue? Aye. Okay, then I'll go ahead and reconvene uh, the city council. And I will reopen the success successor agency. And this is item number 22. Uh oh, which I just 22. got lost. 22. Thank you. Fiscal year 2021 budget and capital improvement program. We shouldn't have closed the uh, successor in the housing because this is joint for all three. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, I believe we're Correct, open. The house Did I close them? No. No. I think uh, housing needs to be reopened. I think I think we did that already, but maybe we want to do it again. Just uh, so I'll open all the housing authority. I thought it was already Thank open, you. but that's okay. It's okay. So all three are open at this all point. Three, for all the three are open. Shall I begin? Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this item is the uh, fiscal year 2020-2021 uh, budget and capital improvement program. Uh, as uh, Council, uh, I'm sure, recalls um, in the last uh, budget uh, study session from the previous meeting, uh, we uh, encouraged uh, Council to make any uh, revisions, any suggested changes that uh, we weren't able to cover that night of the meeting. Uh, between then and now, uh, and I want to just summarize uh, the two uh, uh, changes that came uh, from council members. Uh, uh, one was just a, a description for programming at the Performing Arts Center as efficient. Uh, so that's the latest uh, that you have received this evening, and the changes are also available in the back. And then the other is a little more substantive. Um, the uh, uh, Interfaith uh, Council has uh, typically received $3,000 in funding from the city in our budget uh, over the last several years and uh, was left out of the draft that was submitted to Council at the last meeting. Uh, we have uh, distributed an updated budget that includes the $3,000 uh, in the non-department account for the Interfaith uh, folks. Uh, and in order to do that, it essentially uh, zeroes out the net revenues, was, which was about uh, uh, 29 uh, at the in the uh, uh, draft budget that you reviewed last meeting, uh, with the other $65 uh, in the recommended budget uh, coming from reducing the cash amount in the Community Activity Grant Program. That, those changes uh, manifest themselves in a number of pages throughout the document. Um, uh, and it also changed in the staff report as well uh, because, uh, for example, the 20% uh, set-aside amount is uh, uh, predicated on the expense amount for the budget. So when the expense amount goes up a little bit, that 20% goes up a little bit. And so uh, those changes are reflected uh, throughout the documents in probably six or eight pages that you received this evening. But they are all tied to that same philosophical change, adding the Interfaith uh, Council funding and uh, reducing the cash amount in the Community Activity Grant Program, uh, which uh, again results in a, a net revenue equal to the net expenses for the fiscal year budget for the non-fire uh, uh, component. The fire component, as we talked about before, has the same um, draw from the uh, fire fund balance. But as far as the non-fire component, of the city uh, budget, operations budget, uh, that is uh, basically at zero uh, in terms of net balance. Happy to answer any questions you may have. The whole team is here. <laughs> Jennifer's listed for me and Ryan. Courtney couldn't make it, but uh, we're all here to answer any questions you may have on the budget or the CIP, but staff's recommending that the uh, city council adopt uh, all of the uh, uh, actions in your, and uh, approve the actions in your staff report. The successor, successor agency uh, also approve uh, item number one, uh, and uh, the housing authority approve uh, uh, recommendation number one uh, as well. With that, happy to answer any questions you may have. Very good. Any questions of staff? 
No, but uh, for the city council, this is Dick Riddell. For the city council, I'll move uh, items one through six. Okay, I have a motion to I'll move. second. And a second. Any further discussion? No, uh, just uh, for uh, clarification, the um, budget committee, subcommittee did meet today and we went over um, the budget and we found it to be uh, on target. And of course, we are continuing to explore ways to keep our emergency services budget and our police, fire, paramedic ways that we can keep those uh, budgets from having to dip into other services or funds that we uh, are providing to the members of this community. So we're going to continue to be creative and try to find solutions. But yeah. So, yeah, I, I uh, second that. And I'd like to compliment staff for uh, putting together a balanced budget under very trying circumstances due to uh, the coronavirus and reduced income and all that. But I think staff did a good job of putting this together, and I'd like to compliment them. Agreed. Yes, there's no question about that. Okay. So, uh, no further. So I move in items one through six for the city council. Okay, we have a first, and I believe you have a second. I, I second. You yeah. second it. Mr. Duncan seconded it. Okay, for the city council. Jennifer, you take the roll call vote, please. Councilmember Riddell? Aye. Councilmember Bogue? Aye. Councilmember Duncan? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Allen? Aye. Mayor Avila? Aye, yes. Okay, I'll uh, move the chair over to Mr. Bogue. How about a vote for the su success uh, successor agency item number one? I'll move. Second. We have a first and a second. Will you please take the roll? Board Member Riddell? Aye. Board Member Avila? Yes. Board Member Duncan? Aye. Vice Chairperson Allen? Aye. Chairperson Bogue. Aye. All right, moving to the Housing Authority. We I, have a motion. I just have a comment on that one. Um, was this part of the revised revisions you gave out? Because it says 20 2019. It says adopt resolution approving the 2020 2019 uh, budget. So respectfully request a change to 2021. Yeah, 20, 20, 2021 is yep. what that's supposed to read, just for clarification. Good catch. You know, those numbers, <laughs> like the numbers. So I'll move the item with that revision. So we have a motion. Second. A motion and a second. Jennifer, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Riddell? Aye. Commissioner Avila? Yes. Commissioner Duncan? Aye. Vice Chairperson Allen? Aye. Chairperson Bogue? Aye. So I will now adjourn the success successor agency. I'm going to get that right and the Housing Authority. Very good, thank you, sir. Okay, now it's public hearings. We're gonna open up the public hearing for item number 23. And that's the resolution of ordinary vacations of public drainage easements, et cetera. For me, is that you? I think this is, this is property the, um, tax. Solid uh, waste, I think. Solid right? waste. Solid waste, number 23. Yeah, I think so, sir. Okay, I show it as number 24 on this sheet. Yeah. So maybe my, there's an error, my mistake. Well. I'll look at the uh, agenda here. So public hearing item number 23, the UKIPA Disposal 2019 Annual Report, Solid Waste Rate Adjustment, and the Annual Residential Property Tax Roll Billing. This is, a, as I stated, a public hearing, Mayor and Council. If written or verbal protests against the proposed fee are not presented by a majority of parcel owners, the city may authorize the proposed fee increase. And to date, we've received two, which are included in your packet before you this evening. On April 21st, a member of the Solid Waste Committee met with the city staff and representatives of UKIPA Disposal to review the report and associated fees, talk about the impacts of COVID and overall legislation. So at this time, I'd like to call forward Richard Nino. He will summarize the information that was presented to the committee member and, which is, and also the information that is more detailed in your staff report. 
Good evening, Honorable Mayor, City Council, City staff, and ladies and gentlemen of the public. Uh, my name is Richard Nino with Ucaipa Disposal, and I appreciate uh, your time this evening. Uh, the annual report uh, includes a lot of these statistics for the various programs uh, that uh, Ucaipa Disposal is responsible for here in the city of Ucaipa for both its commercial and residential constituents. Uh, I would like to touch on a few of the highlighted items, uh, particularly those that uh, were a result of last year's uh, contract improvements or enhancements for the community, and I'll go through uh, some of those as follows. <clears throat> uh, street sweeping, uh, the increased street sweeping services started in July of, um, of last year where we uh, are overseeing a subcontractor who provides street, street sweeping services in the residential sector one time per month and arterials up to two times per month and providing uh, city facilities with street sweeping services as well. Um, all of those services are provided at no additional cost to the city or the ratepayers, and we were able, through those efforts, uh, collect 300 tons of debris that would have otherwise gone down through the sewer and stormwater drain systems. Uh, bulky item pickup was an enhancement uh, that also uh, changed last year in July. Uh, prior to that, it was uh, allotted three bulky item collections per year with three items per, per collection for resident. Uh, the program increased to participation up to four times a year with up to five items per collection. As a result, uh, we saw just over 300 tons of bulky items collected for the, during the course of, of last year. And that represents almost twice as many tons as was collected the year prior. So it's a good program that residents are certainly uh, taking advantage of. Another change uh, that residents are able to benefit from is the Sharps Collection Program. Uh, residents may have seen or utilized the program where, uh, wherein we have uh, built and installed a Sharps Disposal Container similar to a mailbox just outside the police department. Residents are able to obtain a uh, Sharps container at City Hall free of charge. We provide up to 300 Sharps containers per year, and those residents that uh, self-medicate at home or in need of lancets or what have you, they are able to properly dispose of these Sharps, um, uh, preventing them from going into the waste stream, deposited in that container, and uh, we uh, collect that material and make sure that it is properly disposed. Through the uh, six months in uh, 2019, we collected over 200 pounds of Sharps material. So another uh, good benefit and good program that's being utilized um, by UKIPA residents. Um, those were the program highlights that are included in the report, but I did want to bring to your attention uh, the section as it relates to recycling costs and recycling processing. You've heard me here over the last several years talk about uh, recyclable commodities prices and how those have impacted rates. Uh, certainly has impacted many recycling operators throughout the state. You may be familiar with uh, Replanet. It was one of the state's um, more uh, prevalent recycling operations throughout the state. They closed several hundred facilities as well as uh, several hundred independent facilities closed throughout the state simply because the value of the recyclable no longer covered their costs. We're talking about processing, residual disposal, transportation, and ultimately sale to, to markets. Um, the market in this case is the international foreign market. And uh, those markets, particularly in China, have all but shriveled up, wherein there are certain plastic commodities, for example, that are no longer recyclable. What we're seeing in the industry is ongoing pressures uh, for recycling facilities and ongoing pressures to recover those costs in order to maintain the programs uh, operable and self-sustaining. Um, that, in fact, is one of the big reasons why we had a uh, increase of uh, the amount that it is this year, as you see in the rate review. And I'll get to that in just a minute. But on the uh, detailed report period for 2019, uh, curious if council had any questions that you would like me to address at this time. 
Any questions of Mr. Nino? All right, then I'll, uh, seeing that there aren't any questions, I'll get into the, the rate review portion of, of the meeting. Uh, the rate review analysis is a, a very detailed process where we look at all of the tonnages that were collected by the various sectors in the prior year. We ad adopt the formulas that are incorporated in the contract for the rate adjustment, which includes a consumer price index adjustment to the hauling operations or the service portion of the rate, a change for disposal and processing costs to cover disposal uh, of trash at the landfill, processing of green waste material so that it is recycled and diverted from the landfill, and lastly, the recyclables processing that I mentioned earlier. Uh, in addition to that, there were some moderate changes in the city fees that are a function of the total rate, and that resulted in the recommended uh, rate option that was elected by the ad hoc committee to move forward to the city council for its consideration. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have on the rate review. Thank you. Are there any other questions of Mr. Well, you, you were going to explain, and I'm, I might be jumping the gun here, but you were going to explain the impacts of the recycling uh, commodities market, how, the, how it impacts, and the refunds that we get back. Sure. And Correct. how that actually, it's so you're not necessarily increasing the rate. What we're doing is we're getting less of a, a, of a credit back for recycling. That is absolutely correct, and I can read to you some numbers that actually reflect that. That credit has gone down almost, has it gone down almost to zero at this point? Well, there, there was a time, and not only here in Yucaipa, but in many, in many California cities where the rate program or the recycling program actually was a negative credit or a credit amount on the rate. So instead of adding costs as we are now experiencing, it actually will help, would help offset any cost adjustments. Um, the revenues, for example, in 2019 from the sale of the commodities, where we are actively trying to market these products and maintain clean products in order to maintain those markets, the revenue in 2019 was $34,000. That is for all of the uh, commercial material that we collected down from the 62,000 that it was the year prior. The residential sector is not too much different than that. Richard, what, what, do you, what was the height of the recycling credits? Like, let's say, let's say go back maybe 10 years ago. I'd say it's um, probably about 10 years ago, it could have been near a dollar. Yeah, about near a dollar credit. And now it's flipped to where it's almost a uh, $2.50 charge per month. I'm sorry, let me, no, $2.02 per month. So over that time span, it's flipped by uh, $3. And it's happened gradually over the years, starting back in 2016, when China announced that they were going to implement their uh, the Green Fence Initiative to mitigate all of the contaminated recyclables that were entering their country. So they tightened up importation restrictions, um, now turned away some materials starting in 2018, and we just started seeing uh, materials costs just plummet. Uh, a real good example of that is mixed paper. In the residential uh, sector, mixed paper, believe it or not, is one of the um, commodities that we most frequently collect. Aluminum cans, beverage containers, things of the highest value, the CRV value, those are generally uh, recycled by residents or some scavengers make their way through the neighborhoods and pick those materials out. Uh, we're left with the balance, which is plastic, glass, cardboard, mixed paper, as I mentioned earlier. Mixed paper at its peak, uh, maybe about 10 years ago, was close to $200 a ton. Mixed paper in uh, early uh, to mid-18 and going into early-19 went down to uh, just about $10 per ton. So when you have an, a decrease of that magnitude, things have to change. Uh, the financial models for mature recovery facilities has to change. Um, and that's why we're seeing some of the increases that we're experiencing today. 
Mm -hmm. um, I wish I could stand here before you and tell you that the day of increases are now behind us, but with COVID-19 um, in the midst, you know, that is having supply disruptions throughout the world, which happens to have impacts on recyclables commodities. There's a uh, anticipated uh, recession because of the COVID pandemic worldwide, which will have additional downward pressures on the value of these commodities. That coupled with additional legislation that is uh, being imposed upon all cities in the state of California by virtue of Senate Bill 1383, part of the uh, climate uh, uh, control initiatives or improvement of our air quality here in California, that too will bring with it additional costs. And most specifically, with a food waste recycling program that uh, all cities will have to provide for their residents. So at the home, we will be asking residents to participate or participate in a food waste recycling program. And that unfortunately comes with additional costs. Okay. I, I just want to comment while you're there is that, uh, you know, it's, it's just mind boggling and you just shake your head because they mandate it, but then the ability to comply and to not put it on the backs of people that are, some people are on fixed incomes. And, you know, when the rate increases are, 13.7 or about 8% 8, 8 for the other barrel or almost 13% for the larger barrel. I mean, that when the CPI is 3%, you know, that, that does hit people that are just working, you know, with their budget to just try to buy food every month. And this is going directly on because they can't figure out how to continue to provide you with the income for the job you're doing in terms of the credits. It's just, you know, hopefully this will resolve because we, that's not sustainable by people, individuals. But, you know, it is what it is. I get it. I read the report. And um, hopefully, hopefully we'll get some relief to our residents in terms of uh, these increases not being you know, w that far beyond the CPI. Right. Yeah. Or perhaps California can get to the point where they process their own trash. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. yeah there's, <laughs> okay. Actually, there's a special commission that just uh, convened, I think it was last week or the week prior, that was established uh, to address these very issues. You know, we have very lofty goals, very high ambitions to have um, clean air quality throughout the state, clear, clean water, obviously. Um, uh, preservation of our landfill space, proper utilization of our natural resources. And this group has been put together to try to address what has been a false sense of security that uh, recycling programs are going great in, in California, that we're doing all of these good things to divert materials from the landfill, when all that time it was, uh, to some extent, you know, it was some of it was real, there's good recycling going on, but there was also some bad recycling going on that ended up overseas and they just got tired of it. So now it's time to pay the piper in the state and see what we can do to remedy that. It just uh, keeps making individuals not uh, have as much discretionary income because it's gotta come from someplace and so, you know, hopefully they'll figure this out because we, we want to make sure people still are able to maintain their quality of life. Right. So. Yeah, this is an issue that I deal with all the time and I have to uh, explain the rising costs, the lack of profit and recycling and all of the changes in the state legislature and, and folks are not happy uh, that they have to pay more, but then I have to explain all the details and, and I deal with this as much as I deal with some of the other things I deal with. <laughs> but you guys are doing a great job. I appreciate your work. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, any other comments? Mr. Riddell, do you have anything to add? Well, I, uh, I want people to realize that this street sweeping uh, that they're providing for us over what it used to be uh, uh, is saving us a lot of money. Plus, we're like uh, Richard Nino said, it keeps from uh, much stuff being going down in the sewer, which formerly went down there. And the bulk pickup—that would—that's a 
quite an increase, too, and that's a free service they're providing for us. And they do such things as uh, uh, the program to pick up uh, hazardous waste and the, uh, also this uh, uh, twice a year they do this uh, pick up the, uh, what you call it, where they uh, shred everything, shredding program. That's a, another added benefit. And they uh, put out free containers for uh, all our programs uptown and uh, uh, things like the car show and uh, things like that. They put out free containers, which is saving us a lot of money. So <clears throat> I think that uh, they're a real good uh, citizen that uh, many people don't realize what they contribute back to the community. And I think it's a... It's uh, it's unfortunate that prices keep going up, but that's the way of life. And uh, you know, like he said, the, uh, the recyclables used to have a good market, but now it's not so good. Plus, with the economy the way it is, there's uh, they're not getting any, uh, getting any aluminum cans or anything. They're all getting pilfered out by scavengers, and I can understand they're doing that too because uh, many of people are hurting, so they're resorting to this. So. Uh, uh, but uh, at the expense of, uh, of the trash collecting. But I uh, personally, uh, I'm very familiar with uh, with the, the the company, and it's a very good, efficient, generous company. And so I, uh, although all uh, increases are a little bit painful, I can understand them and I support it. All righty. Um, Jennifer, do we have any public comments? No public comment, sir. Okay. Since there's no public comment, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Since we pretty much discussed this, is there anything else to add for discussion, council discussion? I will. Can I make a motion? Yes, at this time, if you'd like to make a motion, sir. I will move item one, two, B, three, and four. I'll second that. Okay, so we have a first and a second to move item one, two B, three and four. Do I have a second? Oh, we have a second. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Jennifer, take a roll call vote, please. Councilmember Riddell? Aye. Councilmember Bogue? Aye. Councilmember Duncan? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Allen? Aye. Mayor Avala? Yes. Okay, that passed. Thank you very much. We move on to item number 24, resolution ordering vacation of public drainage easement within APNS, et cetera, et cetera. If I didn't get that one wrong. Thank you and good evening, Mayor and Council Members. This item is for a resolution ordering the vacation of a public drainage easement. In October of uh, 2019, the City of Ucapas Planning Commission approved the uh, a development project, a, a phased development, uh, a phased uh, commercial center on 24 acres located on, on the south side of Yucapa Boulevard between 18th Street and Avenue E. Uh, that development um, will include a, var a variety of commercial uses such as uh, the retail restaurants, uh, retail restaurants, a health club, and the approved plan even includes a uh, uh, location for a future movie theater. A uh, tentative parcel map is also being uh, processed to create the individual parcels for each of the commercial uses. Uh, one of the conditions of approval for that development project uh, requires the developer to vacate uh, an existing public easement within the project site. Uh, that area within the existing drainage easement is not currently being used for drainage, and as you can see on the, on the, uh, on the screen before you, that area is highlighted in green. The grading that has been completed on the site and also the, the uh, drainage improvements that have been approved and are being proposed as part of that uh, development project do not require that existing drainage easement. So uh, staff is recommending that the drainage easement be, be vacated based on uh, several findings that have been made. Um, one, that the city engineer has determined that the drainage easement is of no further necessity to the public. Uh, number two, that a finding of consistency with the city's general plan has been made. Number three, that no objections uh, uh, have been made by the adjoining property owners. And number four, that all city departments and all public uh, utility companies were notified and no responses uh, in opposition have been received. 
So tonight staff is recommending that city council conduct the public hearing and subsequently adopt the, the findings of fact as set forth in the agenda report for this item as to why a public drainage easement within the four properties identified in the agenda report is no longer necessary for drainage purposes and also adopt resolution number 2020-40, approving the vacation of the public drainage easement within those four properties. Uh, that concludes my report and staff is available for any questions you may have. Okay, questions of uh, staff, comments of staff. Hearing none, do we have any public comments, Jennifer? No, sir. Okay, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Open for council discussion. Are we giving- Well, with the, uh, this is Dick Riddell. With the uh, change of topography of the land and uh, the, uh, with the grading that's been going on, the green easement is no longer needed and it no longer serves the adjacent property. So uh, since it's not needed, uh, I don't know why we're keeping it, so I'm in favor of vacating it. Mr. Duncan, did you have a question? Are we giving this to the developer for that particular shopping center, or are we? Uh... Yeah, with a, uh, a non-fee title easement, Whenever you vacate the easement, it goes to the underlying property owner or property owners. I was going to second if if Mr. If Council Member Riddell had. Did he I'll move motion? the item. I wasn't sure who made the if, yeah. if he had made a motion or not. I'll okay. Second. So we have a first and a second. Any further discussion on this? Hearing none, Jennifer, take roll call vote, please. Council Member Riddell. Aye. Councilmember Bogue. Aye. Councilmember Duncan. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Allen. Aye. Mayor Avila. Yes. Okay, we're going to move on to item number or study sessions. Um, item number 25 applications for alcoholic beverages, beverage licenses. And I believe that is city manager or Ben. It will be Ben and Fermin together. Ben starting us off, I think. Mayor Abel Mayor and City Council members, under the city's current review processes, a condi conditional use permit application is required to prevent any new commercial development proposal. However, an existing development does not necessarily require entitlement unless there's an expansion or modification to intensify that land use or uh, the expand the footprint of that building. And so one of the elements to that is the city does not require any specific entitlement for the establishments that propose an off-sale alcohol license. So if you're an existing business, a restaurant, and you're proposing, or an existing retail uh, shop, proposing to add off-sale alcohol licenses, there's no city review process that occurs for that establishment. Instead, our current review process defers all actions to the California Department of Alcohol and Beverage Control, or ABC, to their process. And that means essentially the city takes a neutral approach to those applications and provides neither an approval or denial of such license and just allows that state process to occur. Um, further, the city does not weigh in on findings of public convenience or necessity associated with any establishment that is located in an area of undue concentration with existing licenses. So if there's an oversaturation, the state requires a finding of public necessity and then as part of our neutrality on those applications, we do not either support or deny um, those applications as well. Now this policy really has been designed to allow applicants for the ABC license to work directly with ABC and other interested parties to resolve concerns that may arise either as part of a new project or a new development proposal or an existing business that is also looking to add alcohol sales to their, um, to their business model. Um, now this policy itself is somewhat unique to Utaipa compared to many other cities which have a site plan review process for a new development proposal, so a commission review and approval through the Planning Commission as an example, and then would have a conditional use permit application for specific uses identified in their land use code, uh, among which for most cities, alcohol sales um, is included as one of those uses. Um, so the city itself just has a CEP application just for new development. The only caveat in our city development code is a CEP is required for arcades if it's an existing facility or a new facility, if they're adding an arcade, that is the only one that actually requires its own specific CEP. Now, uh, attached for the commission or the council's review mm -hmm. is uh, to um, kind of development, development code processes for the city of Redlands and Ontario as references 
where they have a specific conditional use permit review process for the sale of alcohol, and then also a separate review process that may occur as well for areas that are within undue concentration. And then they, the city, would complete the public convenience or necessity findings as part of the CEP approval through their planning commission or city council as it would apply. And then the also the ordinances include requirements for existing retailers or deemed approved facilities to address potential concerns as well as to ensure that they comply with their development code provisions for alcohol sales. Now this is brought to city council as a future project is currently under the ABC license process. And so some inquiries have been made regarding that application. And so staff did want to provide to the, the information of the current processing policy and then to also seek any direction from city council on that policy or amendments thereof. And that concludes my presentation. Very good. Any questions of Mr. Matlock? So whose idea was it to bring this to council? I mean, right now, ABC is handling this, right? Exclusively? So it, it was my uh, request that uh, Ben bring this to council. Uh, as he mentioned, it was uh, in response to some inquiries we've received from other folks um, and from council members about what our policies are relative to a project uh, near um, certain uses, uh, like schools, uh, that has alcohol sales, uh, that would include alcohol sales and the ABC process. So there are other communities that have uh, more restrictive uh, policies, uh, ordinances relative to alcohol sales uh, around certain um, uh, land uses, like schools. Uh, and so we are here tonight to seek input from council about uh, whether we should move forward with any changes to our existing policies and ordinances. Has the school district weighed in on any of this? Uh, I understand the school district may be responding to the ABC process once it uh, gets further along in the process. So they may actually be writing a letter of I don't want to speak, yeah, yeah, don't don't speak, speak for the school district, right, but I know right. that there's uh, some sensitivity there. Right, right. But this would uh, give us local control over that application and deciding where, essentially where or not um, those businesses that sell alcohol could open yeah. right across the street from the high school. I mean, that, that proposes directly across from the high school. So um, it, it, there's something to be said about local control. Well, I, I would be opposed to t doing it citywide. I have no desire to control the ABC licenses of the entire city. I think that's kind of an overreach. But as uh, Mayor Pro Tem Allen said, it's, it's a little bit different when the property is adjacent to the high school, let's say. Um, Does ABC take that into consideration at all? So really it's a two-part uh, uh, process or a two-step process. Council may wish to um, weigh in on a particular application relative to the ABC process and leave it at that. Uh, and or council may wish to establish certain requirements, uh, certain uh, ordinance uh, requirements in proximity to uh, schools, as an example, certain land uses. So it may be as simple as giving us direction this evening uh, relative to the ABC application for this particular applicant application, or uh, it may be more comprehensive than that uh, at the discretion of the of the city council this evening. And then I uh, did want to just note quickly as well, the ABC license process would still have to require or occur as well. So if the city, let's say, the example provided city of Redlands or Ontario, when they have an ABC license turn in, ABC still has to go through their review process as well. But then as part of their affidavit, they do verify if a conditional use permit from the local jurisdiction is required in conjunction with their review process. How much staff time would be involved in this? Because right now we're in the middle of the worst economic downturn I think we've ever had, and, and we've got plenty to do already. We do. And we don't have budget to pay for a fire station too. I don't know why we would be going out and looking for more stuff to do when it's already being handled by uh, ABC. So the Perhaps we could take this just as an isolated incident that we don't agree that it would be wise to put alcohol right across the street from the high school. Well, Valero's already there, though. Valero's not too far from that location. And you've got 
Hickory Ranch, which serves alcohol, but they don't sell it in the convenience store. You've got Toscano's that also sells alcohol. What, what's, what's the plan to, do you know what type of alcohol or are they putting in a? It's beer and wine. Typically a, a convenience store sells beer and wine. Yeah, they're proposing a type 20 license and then there is a beer, wine and liquor license at the Utaipa Plaza shopping center just directly east as well. I'll say that um, I received three, um, two complaints and one inquiry regarding this, and uh, which I think may have initiated Ray's um, uh, research into looking at this. Um, this is one of these situations, I believe, that we never really thought about. I know other communities have uh, ordinances that, that um, restrict alcohol sales um, and convenience stores, not including restaurants, but in convenience stores and, and markets within 500 feet of schools or, or, or those types of institutions. And it really has never been an issue for us in the past. And it's just one of these things now where people are becoming more aware and are becoming more vocal about their oppositions to the sales of, of alcohol so close to a high school. Um, in section 18.190.060A um, says that the establishment does not, operational standards, that the establishment does not result in adverse effects to the health, welfare, peace, or safety of persons visiting, residing, working, or conducting business in the surrounding areas. So that can maybe be interpreted as something that the uh, ABC would consider. Um, uh, do they want does that actually put in alcohol sales across the street from a high school? Is that going to be something that might result in an adverse effect to the welfare, safety, and peace of the public? Um, so there are standards for, for uh, Council Members Duncan's um, uh, question. There are standards that they follow, but I don't know how they would interpret it. Um, uh, so I personally think that it's a little strange to put sales of alcohol uh, across the street from a high school. I think the temptation is, is too great to, to sell um, to minors. Um, and I just can't imagine, <laughs> well, I'll stick with the alcohol thing, but um, uh, my opinion is, is that there should not be any sales of alcohol within at least 500 feet of a, of a high school. But so we do have examples of convenience stores, Valero, and restaurants don't usually apply to that. The restaurants are, it's a more controlled environment. They're not gonna sell to minors. And um, uh, convenience stores, I think there's more opportunity to, for sales do to you, minors. Do you, so, do you so, think that stores, convenience stores sell to minors, sell alcohol to minors? Yes, you yes. Do. I have personal, personal knowledge. I've, as in a former job, I used to do things like that. So how can we reconcile this? Because I understand the arguments on both sides, but is there a way that we could um, look at a modification or an ordinance? I mean, with, with alcohol, even tobacco, um, right across from a high school, I just think there's all kinds of issues swirling around that. So is there another way we could go about this in terms of uh, you know, zoning or something like that uh, with our development codes? So, uh, yeah, if really it's up to the council. If uh, you would like us to come back with revisions to the ordinance that restrict alcohol sales or, or other types of uh, sales within certain uh, distances of, of uh, certain land uses, and I'm hearing that schools are one of those land uses, we can do that. If council wishes to uh, simply sent, uh, send um, a letter to ABC uh, relative to uh, this particular application, as I heard somebody mention, and not uh, kind of a citywide approach, we can certainly do that. Uh, we can come back to you with either of those options if you so choose. And then just to quickly note for members of the public, the public notice period for ABC's review of that Type 20 license that drops from the high school initially on uh, June 2nd, 2020, and it lasts for 30 days. So by the start of July, a uh, uh, public comment should be submitted for interest to parties to ABC on that particular license application. So we would have to uh, submit a letter prior to the next council meeting. So that would have to give, you'd have to give us some general direction relative to that letter tonight or more specific direction, I guess. Well, my, my approach 
my approach is I don't want to do a citywide ordinance. I, I just, I mean, and if it was any other right across this, this is literally the one where there's a thousands of kids that walk right there every day. In fact, we as a city council have recognized how important that intersection is because we put a camera there and we put um, microphones and speakers and so forth. We know that that intersection is potentially volatile and we voted on that. So we know that there's, there's potential issues over there. So I would like to write a letter saying, you know, please rethink this one. This might cause a problem later on, but I don't want to do a citywide ordinance. I can concur with that. So we haven't talked about, haven't talked about hours. Uh, this would be a complete uh, uh, alcohol sale prohibition, if you will, at that location, as opposed to hours, right? Uh, hours that uh, they could sell alcohol would be complete prohibition of sale at that location. You know, and I didn't think about the hour thing, but I, I don't know. It would be hard to enforce anyway. I think I, yeah. I would agree. Yeah. I did think that that would be very difficult to. I mean, it's in the case. It, the you know the and so. But does it state Trump City? Does it state, don't we, don't we abide by the governor's order to wear these stupid masks? I mean, don't we, doesn't the state make the rules and we just kind of follow suit? Ultimately, the ABC does make the decision based on input. And do they have a policy now concerning alcohol sales near a high school? Not a, a complete prohibition, no. But, but we can be more restrictive, is that correct? Well, uh, again, there's, there are two different paths to follow. Right. Here. One is a, a letter to ABC. The other is a restric restrictions on uh, our uh, land use uh, ordinances that would prohibit uh, that in certain locations. What I'm hearing at this point is a letter to ABC uh, rather than a citywide restriction. So. Yes, but to Mr. Duncan's um, question, this, uh, local local government can be more restrictive. Yes than uh, the state ordinance. Well, we sure didn't do Mr. that. Mr. Mayor, this is, Mr. Mayor, this is Dave Snow. I just might add a slight clarification. When it, when it comes to land use regulation, the city has a fairly broad authority to, uh, to uh, exercise its land use authority. Um, when it comes to the actual nuts and bolts of licensing, that is something that there are some limitations on and there is preemption with respect to that. However, um, there is room for weighing in on these um, uh, requests for uh, public convenience, uh, as well as, again, the, the local land use authority. Um, so hopefully that helps kind of clarify the landscape a little bit. Understood. Thank you. Do we have another scenario in the city of Yucaipa where this would be applicable? I understand what Greg is saying, but do we have another scenario, hypothetically, you know every street in town, you know where all the schools are, do we have another scenario that's at all like this? Well, we only have yeah. one high school, yeah. so um, I, we have I, would, I wouldn't even be opposed if it was a, uh, I don't think there would be an issue with a elementary school, but we're talking about the high school with thousands of kids walking through that intersection every day. What are they going to put at that uh, fire station location? What's going in there? The coffee shop coffee still? Coffee shop. Okay. That's the, that's the proposal at this point. The only place that we can think of that um, is not a high school. Uh, they had talked about expanding their uh, curriculum, but at this point it's certainly not uh, high school or even a middle school, I don't think, uh, is uh, Inland Leaders and the sales drug location. So I can't think of any other location that even comes close. So. Is there any opportunity for the landowner who's been trying to lease that, build that property for probably 15 years, any chance of him suing us because of this decision tonight when there's a Valero right down the street? I mean, after all, he does own that property. I realize that we have uh, zoning uh, responsibility, but bottom line is if you own that property, this would be a whole different decision process if you owned it, if I that, owned it. That one I would defer to the city attorney if that's, uh, if that's okay. Well, just so you know, my recommendation isn't to change any ordinance. My, my, my recommendation would just be to write a letter of opposition that it's probably good to, to rethink this one. They can, they yeah, can reject sure. it. Go ahead. Mr. Snow, did you have a comment? 
Um, I was just going to say, I think, you know, we, we have a, a public process here for weighing in, and the city can certainly weigh in through this public process. So I don't see an, an issue if the city opts to do that. So I would agree. I think we need to send the letter and state our concerns, and we need to do that ASAP because of the sunshine period, so to speak. And then ABC will make the ultimate decision, which we would have to abide. Primary uh, uh, ju uh, justification for the letter of objection is the proximity to the high school, which is which is everybody's yep. right to do. And it's not just the proximity to the high school; it's the proximity to the entrance. Right. It's the main entrance to the high school. Yep. We're not talking; it's not to the side. This is the main entrance. Okay, understood. Okay, so um, this is not, do we, we don't have a vote, do we? Well, I'm guessing you're not um, unanimous in this uh, uh, decision, so you may want to take a vote just to make sure that we have a clear majority uh, interested in moving forward with the letter. Okay, then so uh, do I hear a motion? I'll move that we write a letter to ABC and, and express our concerns and opposition to the, the permit process. I don't know, how, how would you word it? The alcohol sales in front of the, the high school. Second. That was a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a first and a second. Any further discussion? Jennifer, take a roll call vote, please. Council Member Riddell. Yeah, I'm assuming that if we don't like the letter we get from ABC, then we still have other options. Is we that can, correct? Yeah, we can come back to you relative to the uh, 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 citywide approach, ordinance approach. Um, yeah. Uh, we, if you so choose. I think most cities do re uh, restrict uh, alcohol sales in the San Diego school. It'd be difficult if uh, for the existing establishments if they're within a thousand feet, and I guess they are, that'd be difficult, you know, if, they, uh, if they're selling it down, it's kind of difficult to impose a, a restriction that uh, where, with a new place, it's not that difficult, but with an existing, it's tough. Let's see what the letter says. Okay, how, how do you vote, sir? Aye. Councilmember Bogue? Aye. Councilmember Duncan? No. Mayor Pro Tem Allen? Aye. Mayor Avila? Yes. <laughs> okay, it went four to one in favor. Uh, moving on to item number 26, state vehicle miles traveled threshold update, SB 743. Ben Matlock will be presenting this item. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. I have Jason Pack with Fear and Peers that will help us with a study session and presentation on vehicle miles traveled and uh, the requirements associated with incorporating vehicle miles traveled as the de facto uh, traffic impact analysis under the California Environmental Quality Act, which will has now replaced the level of service as the metric for assessing traffic-related impacts. Uh, the Good uh, evening, Mayor, Council. Thank you for having me here today. So as was introduced, this is a workshop to really introduce the topic uh, that the, as uh, was previously discussed, the state's really good at imposing things on local agencies. Uh, this is part of some of the state's uh, requirements and laws that are being imposed on local agencies. And in this particular case, it has to do with transportation and how we evaluate impacts under CEQA uh, on the transportation system. So next slide. So it's important to note that CEQA is continually undergoing evolution. Senate Bill 743, which as was discussed, is the replacement of level of service with VMT or vehicle miles traveled, and we'll get into that here in a minute. But um, as part of that evolution, CEQA is always changing. So AB 32 has to do with greenhouse gas emissions and the state's requirements to roll that back. AB 1358 is state's requirement that all the local agencies look at complete streets. And Senate Bill 743 is just the latest evolution in CEQA as we undergo it. Next slide. 
So the intent of the legislation is really to try and balance um, managing congestion on a roadway system with uh, three key goals that the state has uh, uh, related to uh, implementing uh, infill development or promoting infill development, promoting public health uh, through active transportation, like walking and biking, and then finally reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, in the state and local area. Next slide. So this process has been ongoing for quite a while. Uh, the legislation was actually passed back in 2013. Uh, the state then handed this over to the Office of Planning and Research. Uh, they uh, messed around with it for the better part of five years, developing guidance, doing outreach, uh, specifically going out and providing a guideline for us to implement uh, VMT as our new CEQA metric. That was all ratified in December of 2018 by the Natural Resources Agency through the revisions to the CEQA guidelines or the CEQA checklist. And uh, as part of that ratification, they gave all agencies until July of 2020, so basically two weeks away, uh, to convert over how we do transportation impacts under CEQA under land use development. Next slide. So um, it, we did talk about uh, previously when we looked at impacts under CEQA to the transportation system, we looked really on how development impact our ability to drive. So it's our impact on personal convenience. So the intent of this legislation is to really change how we look at transportation in CEQA and really start trying to identify how driving impacts the environment. And VMT is the metric that the state has chosen for all of us to implement. That said, most agencies that we work with, including City of Yucaipa, does have a level service policy in their general plan. There's goals and values tied to the ability to maneuver in our automobile. And those can still be evaluated on project by project basis as part of your development approval process. It just won't be tied to CEQA anymore. It'll be part of a general plan consistency finding. Next slide. So with that, we've got a little video we're gonna play that's gonna introduce what VMT is and uh, hopefully it doesn't take too long here. What is VMT? VMT, or vehicle miles traveled, refers to the distance that a car travels regardless of how many passengers are in the car. So this car, traveling one mile, would generate one VMT. And four vehicles, traveling 10 miles, would generate 40 VMT. To understand how much VMT a person generates on a typical weekday, it's useful to map their travel throughout the day. In this example, Jess starts the day at home, drives to the coffee shop two miles away, and then heads to work, which is 10 miles from the coffee shop. After a day at the office, Jess returns home 11 miles away. Later, Jess heads out and drives one mile to the gas station to fill up before driving another three miles to the grocery store, and then makes the two mile trip back home. By adding together the miles driven, it is shown that Jess has generated 29 BMT for the entire day. This VMT can be further categorized into the individual trip purposes that motivated each leg of the trip. VMT can be organized into three typical trip purposes, home to work, or HW, home to other, or HO, and other to other, or OO. This organization is helpful in understanding that trips to and from work tend to generate the most VMT because people are willing to drive longer distances as the benefit of the trip increases. Do you have other questions about VMT that you would like answered? Let us know. All right, so to pick up back up with the presentation. So uh, this is a whole new change, a whole new way that we look at transportation under CEQA. So uh, SPCTA uh, did do a joint study with almost every agency in the county to really help identify some of the key questions that every lead agency is gonna have to address as far as implementation goes. That includes methodology, threshold of significance, what can we adopt as a threshold, and how do we go through that process, what are our mitigation options, and then finally, is level of service still important for your community? Next slide. So to fully implement this at the city, um, it is a recommendation of the CEQA guidelines that thresholds of significance be adopted by local agencies when evaluating this and then creating guidelines to make sure that everybody's doing it the same. And uh, so that's, that's part of what will be coming back to the city, but tonight is uh, uh, here to introduce the topic to you. And then for all projects will be in CEQA documents that come before your council, you'll, you'll be seeing VMT analyses where VMT for a project is calculated, 
We usually look at it as an efficiency metric of transportation. So we look at it as a VMT per person or per capita. And then we compare it to how efficient or how does it compare back to the city of Yucaipa or the county of San Bernardino? And is it higher or lower than that? Uh, ultimately, you document the impact. If you have impacts, we have to mitigate them under CEQA uh, by our requirements. Next slide. So the state did do some good work for us in relation to screening for VMT. So they've set up a whole series of potential projects that wouldn't have to go through VMT assessment. Primarily, these are small projects, projects that are local serving in nature, such that you would see trips get shortened, like local serving retail, or even areas where we can screen a city and identify areas of the city that are more efficient than other areas and screen um, VMT analysis for those specific areas. Next slide. All of this has been incorporated into a screening tool that was developed as part of the SPCTA effort, that joint effort. So any future development will be able to go on here and potentially screen projects and assist with that assessment. So with that, next slide. That is our introduction to VMT. I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank so you. is this, is it, are, we, are we trying to understand how many miles our staff can drive? <laughs> Not for staff, so this would be for development projects. So any development. So, so this is a, this process, when you build a project, you have to calculate now how many possible trips that project's gonna create? Yep, so that is all part of the CEQA process. It's already done as part of CEQA. We do it as part of our greenhouse gas analysis, air quality and energy assessment. This is now just pulling it into the transportation assessment to evaluate impacts of trans on the transportation system. And you can thank the state for that. Yes, I did that insults that word, so. me. I, that <laughs> freaking insults me. So is there like going to be like fines for businesses like in and out that generate a lot of trips? No, so it's important to recognize. So Not this right is now? Just dealing with CEQA. So anytime CEQA gets triggered, so anytime council has a discretionary approval, uh, CEQA gets triggered, and then this would be for any projects that don't meet the screening criteria or the exemptions under CEQA you'd have to go through a VMT analysis uh, if you're not screened. Give me an example of a business that has been identified that doesn't meet the, these uh, new standards. Yeah, so it wouldn't be business by business. So it'd be a new project. So if you have a housing development that comes in for approval of, I don't know, 100 units uh, somewhere in some vacant property in the city or infill development of uh, residential or a new retail establishment, and they're coming for approvals to the council those would be the types of projects where this type of analysis would be triggered. This is just a more thorough uh, study of the vehicle. Miles traveled. Miles traveled for new construction pro projects. Correct, new projects. So it's not, it doesn't really affect anything that we have currently. Just, so, just an addition to CEQA. Yeah, just how we add stuff to CEQA without taking stuff away. So will this determine whether or not we approve a project based on the state's requirements? Yeah, do you guys want to take that? Um, so the easiest way to think of it is as part of the initial study or environmental review process for a project, we have to assess, I think it's 24 or so topical areas, including you know, air quality impacts, um, land use issues, and one of them is traffic impacts. And so the vehicle miles traveled will replace what was traditionally where we did the traffic impact analysis to look at the intersections of the traffic counts that were going on, using that and those impacts as a threshold and would assess level of service. So if there was, let's say, a project that had a high VMT as part of that and had a significant and unavoidable impact, you would have an EIR for that, or if it was something that could be mitigated. So it'd be the same review process as how we categorize other sequel impacts is just changing the metric from just purely the traffic delay associated intersections with level service and focusing more on the roadway efficiency system instead and gauging a project's environmental impact on that metric instead. And then certainly for larger projects, so like the Utapa Point project was recently approved, we would still have a traffic impact analysis that would have been done just to deal with the level of service impacts as well given we have general plan policies to that effect. But it would just, the analysis would be focused more on the roadway efficiency of the land use category and how it serves the existing built environment versus just the level service. 
So on one hand, they're gonna penalize us if we don't build more houses, and on the other hand, they're gonna make it more complicated to build houses. It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. That is absolutely correct. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. I hope the recording got that too. <laughs> stupidest but thing I've ever heard of. What, what kind of challenges, one of the biggest problems with CEQA is that people will challenge it for whatever reason, for their own, for, you know, their own, their own benefit. What kind of challenges will this put on developers trying to get the CEQA process and you know accomplished and, and yeah so I think right now unfortunately with CEQA when we implement changes to it um, the experts come up provide guidance on the the best available way to do it SBCTA did it uh, for all the cities in this region unfortunately it always takes a challenge and then a judge comes in and interprets if what the experts uh, suggested was adequate or not so in my mind, that's, that's the biggest challenge, is that unknown for when it gets challenged and how a judge is gonna interpret implementation. There's a silver lining I hadn't thought about till this moment, and that is that uh, for larger infrastructure projects, you're automatically, <laughs> with this uh, VMT uh, going into place, uh, going into an EIR instead of a mitigated net deck. An EIR is typically, um, more difficult to challenge. Usually what happens in the environmental process is somebody challenges a mitigated neg deck and you don't want to do an EIR. And so you go through that negotiating process, if you will, if you'd rather not go another year for an EIR. So this will force the EIR? This will force an EIR for some of these larger infrastructure projects. The first one was the Wildwood Interchange. It had to do an EIR because of the VMT requirements. And Caltrans' answer was, all interchanges, all interchange modifications were pretty well stuck with EIR. So the silver lining is they're harder to challenge than a mitigated. They're mitigate. harder to challenge, but they're but 10 the, times the more expensive. Yeah, yeah. They're more costly, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's too bad. Yeah. I do want to quickly note EIRs can be more expensive, but sometimes I've, when I was on the environmental side, had done MDs more, but certainly the protections from that. But, uh, it certainly is a new frontier, I guess, for kind of SQL projects and how that level service changed to VMT and what the courts end up kind of ruling on. Uh, we'll kind of see, but we're trying to make the best efforts to have a, a strong process to, to protect those projects. Yeah, well, this I'll thing's, also yeah. just add to that um, adoption of your significance threshold at the council level does also provide you with added protection. Uh, most CEQA attorneys do recognize that if it's gone through a public process and adopted by the by the council, that it provides additional um, protection if challenged um, under CEQA. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do? It is. It is what it is. So, and I think All the right. goal tonight is just to introduce the topic to you. Um, this is a lot to digest, and if we come back and we, with thresholds of significance, it's a very, very long topic to get through in a single week. So. Okay, so now that we're all thoroughly um, upset with the state again, <laughs> thank you very much. Not, we're not going to shoot you. <laughs> that was a great presentation. Yes. Thank you very good much. Good job, good job. <laughs> Okay, possible November ballot measure study session. And that's going to be? That'll be me, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, uh, rest, remainder of the council. Um, as council will recall, we have uh, talked during the budget study session process about options relative to uh, potential ballot measures and other revenue sources. Um, and so we come to you tonight with uh, uh, study session regarding the potential for ballot measures in November and any direction you may have uh, relative to that. Um, uh, there probably are three uh, at least options based on the uh, previous conversations that we've had. One is a, a transient occupancy tax, uh, more uh, modest in the revenue expected, uh, perhaps uh, more palatable, if you will, to the community since it really is uh, a tax that uh, is paid for by uh, visitors, um, not residents. Uh, second option is, and that could be directed to specific um, uh, uses, which would be a 67% um, uh, threshold uh, for approval, uh, or general uses, which would be a 50% plus one uh, threshold for approval. 
the second, op second option is a sales tax measure that's directed at a particular um, use, a particular uh, fund. Uh, could be the paramedic uh, cost, could be the fire and paramedic, could be all public safety. Um, your option. Uh, one option that wasn't listed in the uh, staff report, but we talked about along the way, uh, did a little more follow-up. Uh, the two examples that we uh, uh, talked about uh, recently, uh, one was uh, Measure U in the city of Colton, um, estimated to generate $2.1 million annually, and that is for cannabis businesses, $25 a square foot of space, uh, for uh, cannabis cultivation processing, up to 10% of gross receipts from the sale of cannabis and related products. And again, estimated to generate 2.1 million. That was a general um, tax uh, that went before the voters in 2018 and uh, passed 69.35%, yes, 30.65%, no. The other was the Adelanto example that we talked about last time. And uh, that was... Uh, uh, $5 per square foot for nurseries, uh, up, you know, up to 5% of grass gross, gross receipts, I'm sorry, for other businesses. Uh, that also passed. Uh, their estimate is about $2.5 million a year in annual revenues um, uh, with uh, uh, gross receipts from retail sales, delivery, manufacturing, processing, testing, essentially the whole gamut. Um, and uh, uh, that also passed, as I said earlier. So those are three of the options uh, based on the input that uh, we received in the budget study session processes and other, uh, other discussions. Happy to uh, talk about other options. Uh, you have in your um, staff report a tentative schedule or thresholds for uh, or timelines, if you will, deadlines uh, for the different uh, steps in the process if council um, chooses to put a ballot measure in front of the voters, not to approve the tax, but uh, to approve the uh, opportunity to put a ballot measure in front of the voters for the voters to decide. Those are the deadlines uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that we have uh, come up with relative to the next election cycle. Happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, thank you. Any questions of staff? Well, just a comment, and I've said this twice now in public, uh, this was ex the biggest objection I heard, even though we did everything we could to get this approved the first time around with Measure E, is that the money was not going to be set aside specifically for safety. Um, paramedics, CAL FIRE, and maybe police, uh, sheriff services. I think that that's what we need to do. Uh, Half-cent sales tax for those uh, services only, and just like we have a fire fund, put it into a separate fund and use it for paramedics, first of all, keeping Station 2 alive and well, and, uh, and, and I think we definitely should do it. <clears throat> Mr. Riddell, do you have any questions or comments? Yeah, I do. Uh, the reason we didn't make uh, that measure you or, or uh, measure you uh, specifically for paramedics or safety issues, was it would require a uh, two-thirds voter approval, 67%. And that would be impossible. And I think it would uh, might have got up to 50%, but it would have needed a two-thirds. The reason it went to general fund, and I didn't like it either, but the reason it went to general fund was it only required a simple majority. But to get, to get up to... Uh, Two thirds right now in this climate, I don't think it stands the ghost of a chance right now. I am in favor of uh, the transit tax, the bed tax, with two hotels or one hotel being built for sure and another one probably coming along. Uh, I think we could go for that because if the measure is written correctly, the local residents, the taxpayers, don't pay anything for it. The people who pay the tax are the transit. People who are staying in the hotel from out of town. So uh, I think that one would fly. Uh, my first inclination was to, well, hold off on that one too, but uh, uh, Ray thinks that uh, now would be the time because uh, we'd get less opposition from the hotel. But uh, so I, I think that would fly if it, was, if it was written right and explained right, the transit tax. Uh, 
that, that cannabis thing is sure tempting because other cities are going to be doing it, so why should we be, uh, people are going to be buying the darn stuff anyway. But I don't know, I just can't, uh, <laughs> I haven't adjusted myself to accepting that yet. I'm I'm opposed to marijuana, and, and uh, I just can't go for that one yet, but I would be in favor of the uh, transit tax, the hotel tax. And I think if the if the ballot is written correctly, and if uh, if it's publicized correctly, uh, I think that one would pass because it doesn't cost local residents anything. I, That's my opinion. I, uh, you know, the thing is, is we're looking and trying to think of ways in order to deal with or to fill the gap in our budget for our public safety um, men and women and the services they provide. And looking at the chart on page 641, I mean, this isn't going to do it um, if it passes. So um, perhaps this is one thing we do, but it's certainly not going to solve our problem. With the uh, Measure U and the Measure S from Adelanto and um, from uh, our neighboring city here, Colton. I did see that their population in Colton is very similar to ours. It's interesting, while they're asking $25 per square foot and 10% of the gross receipts, they were only estimating 2.1 million. Is that because they are limiting the number of, of businesses? Whereas in Adelanto, they were looking at five dollars and five percent and estimating 2.5 million is that because of the number that they were going to permit it is it's because of the number and, and the, the the sheer size of the warehouse uh, grow uh, centers in, in Adelanto much different uh, scenario so I kind of look like look at this as what we how we have looked at grant funds in the past somebody's going to get them somebody's going to get these dollars because people that um, particularly choose this as their recreation, their, what they do in their, in their own free time, um, are going to purchase what this particular item, their cannabis, if that's whatever, however it comes. And we might as well benefit or have a tax benefit. And then we don't have to tax anybody because these people are paying taxes for a item that they want to consume. So um, I, I think this one's worth exploring. And as far as the putting back out a tax specifically designated for fire and paramedics, like we have right now, a paramedic tax, I mean, that's what the voters asked us to do. That was the predominant chatter on social media as to why this didn't pass. But I think I'm with Councilman Riddell on this. I'm not sure if we have to get 67% with the current climate, economic client, climate, that you know we're going to prevail. But the question is, what's the cost? What what is our exposure, our cost for doing any of this? Because none of it is going to be decided by this council. This will be decided by the uh, elected or the registered voters in our city. It's really up to them right. as to whether or not they want to do any of this, just like the last measure that they didn't want and, and it was defeated soundly. So the estimate for the election uh, costs uh, on a normal election cycle, additional costs are somewhere in the $15,000 range. Uh, that's a little conservative perhaps. And then uh, to, to whatever extent, uh, there are costs associated with the outreach effort. Uh, those are kind of uh, up to council in terms of uh, the level of uh, outreach effort. Um, one, one could argue that the outreach effort wasn't very helpful uh, for Measure E, and uh, I think uh, there was another grassroots uh, approach that was used in 2004 that uh, might be a better uh, approach, and that's less costly. So the election cost itself is about uh, 15000 conservatively. Well, and we just need to continue to try to solve the problem, and we need to continue to be creative in how we solve the problem. We know there's a deficit 
in our funding stream, we know the, how the increases are going to occur because that's already been negotiated. And I think we just need to continue to kind of be open-minded and explore different options. You know, with regard to this uh, Measure E, uh, I've been meeting at their request. I've been meeting with Liz Brown, the head of the uh, Firefighters Union, with Steve Shaw, you know, our retired fire chief who had a higher job in the city, and with Jensen. And they're very much in favor of, uh, of, of, of establishing a, a, media, a committee and, and including the public in the committee and... Uh, they're, they want to participate in it, and we do have a, a local fire committee uh, on the council, but they, they, they're not in favor of doing it now. They, just, they say they don't think it would stand a chance to uh, try for it right away. They want to study it for about a year and then go back and try it again, uh, either with the sales tax or with something else, but they want to study it for a while. So I, I don't think we ought to move ahead with that at all. And we'll have plenty of time to discuss the pros and cons and all that on it. It wouldn't pass right now anyway, and if it fails a second time, then we could just throw the whole thing out the, the window. So I, I don't, I'm not in favor of a sales tax, even if we specify it strictly for fire and paramedics or safety or whatever. But I do think that the, the hotel transit tax would pass. And we could specify that money going to uh, uh, paramedics and, and, and fire, too. You know, there, there's no reason why that can't be written with the, the post, those tax policies would go for that purpose. So uh, if that's the way we want to do it. But uh, I think that's the only one that would stand a chance right now. Unless you want to go for this cannabis thing, and I'm, I'm opposed to that, even though it looks like a heck of a moneymaker. Uh, I don't want to. I think the city, if we propose uh, that, the, the city go berserk. So I, I don't think that uh, that's wise at all, and I'm uh, morally opposed to it. So I, I like the transit tax. I think that's one we should go for and write it up careful. And as far as uh, the sales tax would be a great money maker. Maybe we could get two thirds sometime in the future, but the fire people are—they say they, it wouldn't stand a prayer right now. And you know, they, uh, the firefighters—they're the ones that had most contact with the public because they were out sitting in front of stators uh, every day for quite a long time and everything. And they had a lot of uh, discussion with the public, and they don't think it would stand a chance of getting two-thirds now. And it didn't stand a chance of getting two-thirds then either, I don't think. But uh, if we uh, have this meeting with them, leaders in the in the fire and also our, our city people and the public, I think we could come up with something and, and, and sell it in the future, but not right now. And that's their opinion as well. So, well, I'm in, I'm in favor of the transit tax and and to, to help sell it, uh, maybe we should specify that it goes to fire and paramedics. If anybody has any knowledge of who the uh, developer of the hotel is, and uh, um, that concept is probably three years in the making at minimum. Uh, and this budget problem is a problem we have right now and not three years from now. And I don't see, I don't know any other plans to have another hotel right now since the freeway corridor seems to be sacred ground to a lot of people. And I don't see a whole lot of favor there in building a hotel, but that hotel there at uh, Oakland Road in the freeway, um, I know who owns that property. I know who's developing that property. And I know how that will go as, I, as my understanding is right now. Um, we paid a consultant a lot of money to tell us the best way to go was to put that on the ballot and, uh, and uh, go for 50% approval. And uh, so regardless of what CAL FIRE thinks, as far as their prophetic utterances of what will or will not pass, 
I know that everyone that I've talked to said that uh, they would have approved it if it had gone to a different fund than just the general fund because the majority of Americans don't trust politicians with money, as a matter of fact. Um, I guess we could take an insult to that, but uh, our reputation precedes us. <laughs> I, I still agree that I think we should put it on the ballot and I think we should advertise it that, you know, I, I didn't think anybody would even say close station to. I know you mentioned it a couple of times in the process of presentation, but I'm absolutely opposed to that. I think that's nonsense. I think we should cut anything and everything else before we close a fire station or change it to whatever. Yeah. But I think we should put it on the ballot. I think we should put that on the ballot. That's my opinion. Just for the record, it was uh, converted to a medic squad just because 78% of our I, I understand medics. that, but yeah. that still yeah. puts a fire truck sure. at station one or station five, and that still doesn't do any good for the folks over there in, in that area at all. Well, and it doesn't sound like the financial um, investment to bring back to the voters what they asked us to bring back to them is uh, really that much of a risk. Um, I'm going to continue to argue for this other one as well because uh, I just think that it's up to the people who live here, up to the voters to decide. And you put an initiative out there, including this cannabis thing, and if they want it, then they'll vote for it. If they don't want it, they'll vote it down. But I, I for one, have argued this from the very beginning about this particular um, item in that uh, really that's, in my opinion, a person's freedom of choice and that the government really shouldn't be telling them what they should or shouldn't be doing you know, in their free time. Now, you know, if they're out breaking the law, that's a different thing. But... You know, this is a personal choice, and uh, people should have the right to, to make that choice. They do now, and we certainly should, uh, if we can, we've got a budget issue that we need to deal with and we need to resolve. We shouldn't just throw it away because we have some ethical uh, problem that we're having to deal with within our, ourselves. Let's leave it up to the people to decide. Would that include the 12th Street in front of the uh, you high bet. school? Yeah, we'd have to make sure that we know. Well, we don't want it there. You bet. So there are limitations. Well, and just we like with alcohol an and tobacco, I, yeah, I, I would feel the same way about uh, any adult beverage of any sort. Yes. <laughs> well, I was told by a guy that was advocating for this uh, for the. Uh, pot dispensaries, that there are currently six delivery companies delivering into Yukaipa delivering this product, and we, we, uh, we voted not to let that happen, but it's still happening. Yeah, that was a, and Dave may, may want to weigh in on that, uh, David Snow, but uh, that was a state law that uh, came into play uh, this last year that uh, precluded um, cities from uh, uh, disallowing uh, deliveries and in, in, didn't they allow us community. to make that rule? Yeah, well, we can't do that anymore. We need to update our our ordinance because they overruled us. So on one hand we can't, and the other hand we can't, <laughs> yeah. and can't, and can't. Yeah. It's like confusing as heck with the state of California. But I would I would support. Uh, um, putting it back out, the uh, sales tax as well. So but I support both of them. Are you suggesting that we put both ballots on the, both measures on the ballot, the pot and the... Uh, why not? Fire station too? Yeah, well, why not? I mean, again, it's not up to us. It's up to the voters in the city of Yucaipa as to whether or not they want to vote for it. And these other two cities, Colton... I mean, the percentage of, of votes that approved it were 70%. That's pretty compelling. Maybe we should do like Javier Becerra and go ahead and word it, uh, save fire station two. <laughs> Instead of a half cent sales tax, just say, say do you want to save fire station two? I'm not suggesting that to yeah. be a reality. I'm no. just saying that's how the state does it. I, Which I, tax I, are you I, talking about? <laughs> What's that? I didn't hear what he said. Um, I actually concur with Council Member Riddell that um, considering the political climate that's been created and um, in the state and, and obviously having 
some issues with the one that we tried to pass recently and some of the, the ongoing issues that we have right now, I think uh, trying to pass any kind of sales tax at this point is, is futile. I don't think it's gonna happen. I think uh, it'll lose. And so I don't support any of them. Yeah, studies show that about a third of the voters, anything that says tax, they don't even read it. They don't even read the measure. They just write no if it says if it's a tax. So uh, getting the sales tax now and getting two thirds approval would be impossible, and it would just muddy the, the waters more. So we could couldn't do it in the future. I think it'd just be crazy to try it now. I agree with you, uh, but I also agree with the TOT tax that I think is a tax, and they're not going to they're not going to accept that either. I think just considering the climate right now, it's not going to happen. You could keep putting it out there, and we keep getting what what did we lose on Measure E seventy to thirty? Yeah, it's thirty five percent four, I think something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I don't know. I'm 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 torn. Um, I don't think we'd win any tax measure to um, uh, fire tax. I don't think it's going to fly. I, th I think because for the reasons that that Greg talked about, uh, the economic climate right now is just not going to support that. Um, uh, people are out of work, and uh, now they're going to be asked to, and, and who knows how long it'll take for them to recover, and now they're being asked to pay an extra, an extra tax even if it is for the fire department. Uh, I, I, I just don't think that'll fly. Uh, for the marijuana thing, it's a it's, uh, moral and ethical issue to me. Um, I'm trying to separate myself from, from that and trying to figure out what's best for the community. And maybe Denise is right, just give it to the public and let them make that decision. Um, and. Uh, the TOT, I think, is a good idea, but Bobby had a good point. It's, um, Ed's taken forever to do <laughs> to do this project, and we don't know when that's going to come to fruition. So it may be <laughs> three or five years down the road before before we can benefit from it. Um, I don't mind putting it on the ballot, but we we do under with the with the understanding that. Some other hotel developer is going to come in and probably get his job, you know, his, his project completed before Ed does, and that's still three years down the road, minimum. So, um, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a little torn, a little, don't know what to think. Um, I don't have any good answers. So, how's that for leadership? <laughs> I think what I'm hearing is uh, con not, no concurrence on a particular measure. And, and by default, there will be no measure. <laughs> That's it. That's probably Somebody... wise. <laughs> that... We might have to wait for mid-year next yeah, year when yeah. things settle down. I, I, I understand. Well, then I think that we need to put the thinking cap on and start looking at some other options, maybe some things to get more businesses in here, more commercial development, but we, we cannot just not keep addressing the budget and the, the differential that is going to continue to occur in uh, that budget line. So it, these things didn't, okay, so these three things that were brought before us, we obviously can't come to a consensus on. So we just need to maybe be creative and come up with some other options that we might be able to come to consensus on that will help us to, um, you know, close the gap on this uh, funding issue with our paramedic services particularly, but with other services that are escalating in cost at 5% or greater, whereas our income is only coming in 2.53, and the only way you can make that up is to take it out of other city services, and in a lot of reasons, that's just not right. So um, there's a lot of things we've been able to do and provide for the members of this community, and you don't want to slow down in public works. You don't want, you know, 
street conditions to deteriorate. I can go on and on and on. So we, we do need to figure out how to solve this problem. We will come back to you with uh, more discussion. Um, just a reminder, this year, uh, the fire uh, and paramedic um, imbalance was somewhat offset by some of the the one-term fixes, the one-time the one fixes that uh, uh, council approved this, this time around in terms of deferring equipment purchases and, and reducing the uh, upfront uh, salary costs, recognizing that uh, savings in uh, difference between the uh, uh, what, what we uh, use in the schedule, which is the top step versus the actual cost. Usually we take that savings at the end of the year, we move that to the front of the year with the budget this year. And so uh, what that means is that differential, but as you suggested, the differential between the 5.5% a year increase and the revenues at 2%, 2.5%, whatever they are, is going to continue to grow. And uh, not exponentially. I don't want to leave you with mm -hmm. that impression, but it's going to continue to grow pretty significantly. So that uh, fund balance, that fire fund balance, uh, will last only so long, uh, which means we definitely have to come back with some some ideas, some thoughts. Um, you know, one of the other options out there that we talked about that is probably not very well thought of by many is uh, CFD for operations. Uh, that's what Bo Beaumont uses. I'm not saying it's the right answer, but it's another answer for police or fire costs. So uh, whether it's, a, and it wouldn't be a complete answer, but it might be a partial answer. So those how, are the kinds of things that we can come back to you with. How would that work, a CFD? Uh, community community facilities. Finance District? Mm -hmm. uh, where uh, not just infrastructure is funded, but actual operational costs. And, and you could bring that back to us for yep. another study session. So, okay. We'll do. And yeah, I, I would suggest we do that. I yeah. would like to know more about that. Yeah. Yes, sir. And just, just to be clear, when you have a 5% increase and then you put a, another 5% increase on that 5% increase, it is more exponential than linear. Yep. It absolutely is. And then ultimately, I think we should still work with our partners in the water district and the school district and look for ways to help mitigate some of their um, high costs that can further attract businesses um, into our community. And that's, that's some of the issues, too, that we have. We just can't get people in here because of the high fees that, that they have to pay. Understood. All right. So we've done that. Uh, moving on to announcements. Are there anything? From so we're just dropping this for now, right? <laughs> and, and no consensus. I, I, that's right. No consensus. I, I think that's wise. Uh, since uh, we've got five different opinions here, we probably have at least that meeting in the public. So trying to get a tax measure passed right now probably is, is uh, pretty remote. So just postponing it for a while. I think that's wise. We can look again at mid-year if we need to. All right, any announcements from the dais? Nothing. I no have none. All righty, closed session. City Attorney Snow, this is your opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We've got three items on the, this evening's closed session. The first is a conference of legal counsel regarding existing litigation. It's workers' compensation claim number SAC 00017065, Hemsley versus City of Ukaipa. Um, we uh, may there may be reportable action on that item. With respect to public, uh, the other items: public employee uh, performance of evaluation of the city manager. And then separate item, conference of the labor negotiators, uh, the negotiators being the mayor and Mayor Pro Tem, uh, with, regarding uh, the uh, unrepresented city manager position. Um, and we wouldn't re expect reportable action on those latter items this evening. All righty. We'll go ahead and we'll close the public session and move to closed session. Uh, we'll, we'll take a five-minute recess. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for sticking around. You guys have a pleasant evening. I tried. <laughs> well.